I call this meeting of the Northeast Independent School District to order. Let the record show that a quorum of board members is present, that this meeting has been duly called, and that notice of this meeting has been posted in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code Chapter 551. The board will now adjourn into executive session pursuant to the following sections of the Texas Open Meetings Act. Section 551.071, private consultation with the board's attorney. 551.072, discussing purchase, exchange, lease, or value of real property. 551.076 to discuss the intruder detection security audit and the time is 531. The board will now convene into open session the time is 624. On behalf of the trustees, I would like to welcome you to this evening's meeting of the Northeast Independent School Board. This is a business meeting of the board held in public. We appreciate your attendance and request your respectful attention. We welcome your comments during the matters from the floor section of the agenda. If you signed up to address a specific action agenda item, you will be called at that time. We wish to emphasize that this is a business meeting of the board, and while those in attendance may disagree about issues, it is our expectation that everyone will conduct themselves in a respectful and professional manner. Disruptions to this meeting by anyone will not be tolerated. In the event any person or group disrupts the meeting, a warning will be given to stop any disruptive behavior. Anyone persisting in disruptive behavior will be removed from the meeting. The board may also call a recess in the event of persistent disruption so that individuals who engage in disruptions can be removed. It is our intent to conduct the meeting in an orderly fashion. Finally, I would like to remind you that it is the mission of Northeast to challenge and encourage each student to achieve and demonstrate academic excellence, technical skills, and responsible citizenship. Item five, invocation and pledge of allegiance. A, Northeast Transition Services, Ms. Gonzalez. Good evening, Madam President, board members, Dr. Micah, executive staff, and guests. My name is Lorena Atkins. I am the proud principal of NETS. It is my pleasure to be here today with two outstanding students. Both students exhibit diligence, confidence, and kindness that make them extraordinary leaders on our campus. Providing the invocation for this evening is Ben Guar Durama. Ben is here today with his mom, Michelle Valdovinos, stepdad, Alfredo Perez, siblings, Isabel, Genesis, and Leo. Please stand and be recognized. Ben has attended NETS for two years where he has gained a variety of skills. Ben has received a certificate of attendance from Lee High School. He is currently an intern in the Project Search Program at Christus Santa Rosa Hospital, Alamo Heights, where he is receiving hands-on job training, mentoring, and support. He has volunteered in the admissions, med search, and housekeeping departments at the hospital. The hospital employees rely upon and appreciate all of Ben's hard work and the positivity he brings to his work daily. Ben has received two superintendents awards for completing volunteer work through NETS. Ben is a wonderful role model for his siblings, peers, and those who have the pleasure of working with him. Reciting the pledge this evening is Michael Valerio Benavides. Michael is here today with his dad, Michael Benavides, and stepmom, Priscilla. Please stand and be recognized. Michael is a first year student at NETS. He has thrived with his transition skills and independence. Michael has received a certificate of attendance from Churchill High School. During his time at NETS, Michael has volunteered at NEPD, BFI Treasures, and the Duseum to build his vocational skills and help him access his post-secondary goals. He has also received a senior award for his involvement and dedication to Special Olympics and is part of a unified Special Olympics team called Best Friends. We thank you all for the opportunity to be here this evening and thank you for serving our community and our school district. At this time, Ben, please approach the podium for the invocation.
The man who wants a garden fair or a small or very big with flowers growing here and there must bend his back and dig. The things are mighty few on earth that wishes and attain whenever we want and of any work we've got to work to gain it matters not what goal you seek it, it's secret here responds you've got to dig from week to week to get results and, or roses Michael, please approach the podium to recite the pledges. I pledge you to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic which is stand one nation under God, individual, with liberty just for all. Honoring the, the Texas flag, I pledge to the, to the Texas Warden the State Honoring God with an individual. Ben and Michael, will you please come forward because we have some certificates and we'd like to take a picture with you. Thank you for being here. You're welcome to stay, but you're also welcome to leave. <laughs> so thank you again. That was wonderful. Item six, recognitions. A, President's remarks on acknowledgement of special calendar events. Um, April 15th to the 19th is Public School Volunteer Week. April 24th is Administrative Professionals Day. May 1st is School Principals Day. May 6th to the 10th is National Teacher Appreciation Week. May 6th to the 12th is National Nurses Week. And May 12th to the 18th is National Police Week. So if you um, see any of these people, please thank them for um, what they do every day for us. We appreciate that. Item B, Regional Spanish Spelling Bee winners, Mr. Jarrett. Thank you, Madam President, members of the board, executive staff and guests. I would like to ask Alicia Calderon, Senior Director for our Bilingual Program to come forward for this agenda item. Sorry. Good evening, uh, Madam President, board members, Dr. Micah, staff and guests. So every year, the Education Service Center, Region 20, holds the Regional Spanish Spelling Bee here in San Antonio. Each participating district sends their district winners to this competition. We have elementary, middle school, and high school, all three different um, levels of competition. So this year, we have Caleb Caro from Coker Elementary and Nathan Martinez from Eisenhower Middle School um, who represented us um, at the Spanish Spelling Bee. And they represented Northeast ISD in an outstanding way. Uh, they both won their competition, and now they are heading to the national competition this summer in El Paso, Texas. So I would like to invite Ms. Scott, principal at Coker Elementary, and Mr. Herrera, principal at Eisenhower Middle School, to introduce their Spanish, B, uh, Spanish Spelling Bee champions. Good evening, Madam President, members of the board, Dr. Micah, executive staff, and guests. My name is Ashley Scott. I'm the principal at Coker Elementary. 
It's my pleasure to introduce to you one of our finest Coker Cubs, Caleb Caro. As mentioned, Caleb is the Northeast ISD and Region 20 Spanish Spelling Bee champion. He will compete at the National Spelling Bee this summer, um, along with other state and region winners. Caleb is a fifth grade student at Coker. He's been part of the Northeast ISD dual program at Coker since kindergarten. He's an anchor for our K-Cub Morning News. He plays in fifth grade strings and is a part of our Hyper Accelerated or HAM program. Celebrating with Caleb tonight is his mom, Linda, and dad, Mario, who's watching via live stream because of a business trip, as well as his fifth grade homeroom and math teacher, Mr. De La Garza, and our bilingual instructional coach and Caleb's spelling bee coach, Ms. Siskovitz. At this time, I'd like to ask Caleb's family and special guests to stand and be recognized. <clears throat> So it's an honor to celebrate Caleb's accomplishments with everyone here tonight as he represents the very best at Coker Elementary. I thank his family for being part of our NEISD family and entrusting him to our care. Congratulations, Caleb, and good luck this summer. Good evening, Madam President, board members, Dr. Micah, executive staff, and guests. It is my pleasure this evening to recognize Eisenhower eighth grader, Nathan Martinez. Nathan. Right there. Joining Nathan this evening is his mother, Emma Ortiz Rivera, his father, Efren Martinez, his aunt, Maria Ortiz, and his uncle, Alvaro Ortiz Rivera. Please stand and be recognized, parents and family. I would also like to recognize our Spanish teacher, Ms. De Leon. Ms. De Leon has coached and mentored Nathan for the last two years. Thank you, Ms. De Leon, for supporting Nathan on his journey. On February 6, 2024, Nathan competed at the annual Region 20 Spanish Spelling Bee. Nathan competed against 16 other school districts in the region and won first place in the middle school division. With the win at the region competition, Nathan has qualified for the National Spanish Spelling Bee competition this June in El Paso, Texas. Nathan's journey began last year as a seventh grader when he won the Eisenhower Spelling Bee and then placed fourth at the NEISD Spanish Spelling Bee competition. After that competition, Nathan practiced for about 20 hours a week, learning accentuation, punctuation, and Spanish terms, leading up to this year's district competition, where he placed first, and then the region competition, where again, he won first place. Currently, Nathan is practicing 15 to 20 hours a week in preparation for the national competition in June, all while maintaining high grades as a GT student. Nathan is extremely confident in himself and expects to win this national competition. <laughs> Nathan, we wish you the best of luck and we are all behind you. Congratulations. <laughs> Nathan, Nathan. We'd like to take some pictures with Caleb and Nathan, please. Congratulations to you both. And we expect you to win also, Nathan. <laughs> Oh yeah, get your trophies. Good luck to you both. 
Item C, Junior Varsity Dance National Game Day Champions, Johnson High School. Thank you, President Grona, members of the board, Dr. Micah, executive staff and guests. Julie Shore, executive director for Fine Arts, will address this agenda item. Good evening. Thousands of dancers arrive in Orlando, Florida with a lot more on their minds than just Mickey Mouse. These dancers have been putting in the work for over a year in hopes that all of their hard work would pay off and everything would align just right for their dreams to come true in the hopes of coming back with a black jacket. The black jacket is a symbol of ambition, drive, and perseverance. I am so proud to say that this team accomplished their dream by winning the National Dance Alliance High School Dance National Championship first place for their JV game day routine. They were also awarded the highest scoring first place JV team of the entire competition. This is such a huge accomplishment and I am so glad that we are celebrating these amazing dancers this evening. Please join me in congratulating the following dancers and their amazing coach. First off, Ashlyn Barrow. Malia Berdoza. Kai Carter. Aubrey Kessler. Kylie Deline. Natalie Espinosa. Caitlin Fernandez. Abriana Garcia, Isabella Guevara, Paulina Moreno, Olivia Tijerina, and Alessandra Torres. I would also like to recognize their amazing dance director, Ms. Stephanie Trevino Fulan. Congratulations to all of you. We are going to group up for a picture, so kind of do two rows, level off. Congratulations, girls. Thank you for coming. Item D, Cyber Patriot National Finals, Roosevelt Cyber Patriot Team. Go ahead. Yes, good evening. Chance. Tonight I'm pleased to bring before you the Roosevelt Rough Riders JRTC Cyber Patriot Team. Recognize them for exceptional achievement throughout the course of the entire year. Cyber Patriot is a national youth cyber defense uh, competition sp sponsored by the Air Force Association. It's broken down into two divisions, an open division, which any team or club can join, or a JROTC division, which is limited to JROTC organizations, and that's where our teams compete. The competition begins in the fall with two rounds of competition, followed by a state round, a regional round, and then the granddaddy, the national round. All teams participate up to the state round, but only a select few go on to the regionals beyond. So how did our Cyber Jedi Warriors do? They took first place among all JROTC programs in the state of Texas, making them, once again, state champions. They sailed through the semifinal round into the national round, not only as the highest scoring Army JROTC worldwide, but the highest scoring JROTC all services worldwide. 
you might say that the Roosevelt Rough Riders could never be eclipsed. You can blame yourself, you let me speak. Are we, are we done with funding on the tower yet? <laughs> but maybe on my salary, who knows? At the national round in the all-service battle, which is an all-service battle of JROTCs, the Rough Riders once again excelled. They took third nationally in the Cisco ch Challenge and third nationally overall. This is the sixth year in a row the Rough Riders have qualified for the Nationals, and the fifth time in those six years they've placed in the top three. Quite an extraordinary achievement. We're excited and proud of our Rough Riders, and it was with pleasure that we recognize them this evening. First, the team captain, commander, Cadet Lieutenant Colonel Shema Kalich. And I might add that Shema is graduating this year, and she's going on to that Stanford University. Yes, you are. she's obviously yes, so obviously taking the easy route. We have Cadet Captain Tina Say. Cadet First Sergeant Jaron Glazer. And Cadet Private Corinne Kenlaw. We want to recognize their coach, Major Jamel Garner. Representing her this evening is Command Sergeant Major Jody Stanley. Their, their mentor from ICSI, Mr. Josh Beck. And of course, their super support they always receive from their principal, Mr. Brian Norwood. Congratulations and thank you. Item seven, matters from the floor. The trustees welcome comments from members of the public during this time of the meeting. Generally, board members do not respond to public comments during the meeting, although members may request further information or a future agenda item on a matter raised during public comment. As explained fully in the board's written procedures for this time, the matters from the floor portion is a limited public forum. Accordingly, speakers may present on a topic related to district business for up to three minutes but are not permitted to make one personal complaints about an individual staff or board member that should be raised using the district's grievance policies. Two, a personnel action. Three, a student disciplinary matter. Four, a complaint about a particular student. Five, or pending litigation. Any person who persists in speaking on these topics after being directed not to do so will lose the remainder of their time to speak and may lose their privilege of addressing the board at future meetings. If you signed up to speak on a specific agenda item, you will be called up when the board reaches that item. Please remember that this is a business meeting of the board. Any person or group engaging in outbursts of any kind causing a disruption to the meeting will be warned, and if they persist, will be removed from the meeting. This is to ensure that all speakers have an opportunity to make comments without interruption and that the board members are able to pay full attention to speakers without any distractions. We also welcome written comments at any time, either through email at board at neisd.net or by mail care of the superintendent's office at 8961 Tesoro Drive, 6th floor, San Antonio, Texas, 78217. Ms. Huey. Number one. Good evening. My name is Linda Chapman. I just want to start out by reminding parents of the upcoming school board elections and urge parents to vote for the candidates who understand that parents' rights must be respected. 
Um, I urge parents to vote for Steve Hilliard, Dick Rasmussen, and Michael Gerwitz if you live in Districts 6, 5, or 1, respectively. Uh, early voting starts April 22nd, to the, goes through the 30th, and Election Day is May 4th. Historically, only about 10% of registered voters, voters vote in school board elections, so it is really important that parents who want to see the woke agendas in schools go away, they get out and vote. I also want to mention that more parents need to come out to these meetings. I saw so many come out during COVID to protest the disgusting forced masking of our children. If you don't think they will do that again, you are mistaken. A woke leftist school board will do anything they can get away with because they have an agenda. They don't care about parental rights. I also want to mention again for parents to go to themindpolluters.com and watch this film so you will be aware of all the sneaky ways that schools are indoctrinating children into homosexuality and transgenderism. For those of you that are thinking it isn't happening in Texas or here in NEISD, you need to wake up before your child comes home one day telling you they are a different gender. And then to make it worse, you find out school has been letting them use the opposite gender bathroom and calling them by a different name for months. This is happening all over the country, and you need to be able to vote for people who don't support that kind of perversion. Just as an example of that, I urge parents to start digging in and researching the books that are in the NEISD school libraries available for children to check out. There are numerous books on homosexuality and transgenderism. These books are nothing more than tools used by pedophiles to desensitize children and sexual, to desensitize children to sexual topics and ultimately groom these children. Let's get rid of woke school boards. Thank you. Number two. Hello all, my name is Juliana Plews. I graduated from Keller High School in the Dallas area in 2023 and I'm currently a university student. During my time in high school, my school district, Keller ISD, made national news for its extensive removal of books from our schools. This act of censorship created an environment that feared controversy and the repercussions administrators, educators, and students may face as a result of interacting with controversial material. Now in college, I have gained perspective on how consequential this environment can be for students. I'm currently taking an education and sociology course learning about education laws and the sociology of schooling. To a, as such, I am here as a voice of accountability for Northeast ISD to address its book removal policy that began in March of 2022. The five reasons given by NEISD for book removals account for evaluating a book's credibility using phrases like outdated and poor professional reviews for justification. As explained in the American Civil Liberties Union address to the board sent on April 20th of 2022, these justifications hold no legal bearing and violate the First Amendment and Supreme Court President Island Trees v. Pico. This evaluation of a book's credibility is a thinly veiled attempt to keep books deemed controversial from NEISD students. The district's removal of books has a, proof, has a profound impact on its students by creating an environment that fears controversy. For one, this environment prevents healthy questioning of topics students will face in the real world. If your child does not come into contact with alternative perspectives and diverse voices, how will they know how to react when faced with these material in college or job settings? Keeping books on shelves allows students to ask questions in a safer space than the alternative source of their friends or perhaps the internet. This environment also creates tension between educators and parents who have to toe an unfamiliar line of what may or may not be considered objectionable by families. When educators are encouraged to err on the side of caution, students lose the ability to participate in healthy debate and to think critically about their own opinions. Additionally, NEISD prides itself on the college pathways it provides to students. However, as a college student myself and in discussion with my professors, I can confidently say that removing books damages your children's ability to succeed at the college level. Universities challenge students with polarizing material and diverse perspectives. Your students' lack of experience utilizing critical thinking in this area will become evident in higher ed, where one's ability to understand and respond to controversial issues determines your success. The policy of book removal in my own district came into practice during my senior year. I saw the frustration, chaos, um, and confusion firsthand in my own experience. Um, was that my time? No. Okay, well, 
Northeast ISD, I urge you to embrace alternative opinions and go against the fear of controversy. Controversy is the starting point of learning. You're doing a disservice to your children and their future by allowing this environment to prevent their success. Thank you. Number five. Good evening. My name is Michael Gerwitz, and I'm a candidate for this board in the upcoming election. Uh, doing my research, I gained uh, information, or received information, actually, directly from the district about the performance of its students. What I found out was that over the last five years, the average grade of the average graduating senior collectively in all five, all seven campuses, their grade point average exceeded 90%. That was the average student. More than half the students each year graduated with academic honors, which required a 90% grade point average. Additionally, the bottom half of each class averaged an 80-point GPA. Very impressive, if true. So then I turned to the TEA website, and I got information about the scores that the district has been receiving at all grade levels during the same period of time. And they're quite inconsistent. Essentially, at every grade, and the, the star tests are given through grades three through eight, and then certain end-of-course uh, topics in high school. And they were consistent in that every time a particular skill was tested, reading mathematics in particular, that 40% or more of the students in each grade level were found to be performing below grade level in reading, and approximately 50% of the students were performing below grade level in mathematics. In addition, when you get to high school, uh, you're tested end of course out, uh, English 1, English 2, and Algebra 1, and those b below level performances continued. So additionally, I then turned to look at the statistics on what percentage of the students in high school were performing above grade level, because the grades that students were receiving would indicate to me that they were A students, they should be performing above grade level, and in reading, the average for uh, English 1 and English 2 is about 13 percent, and the average for uh, Algebra 1, this is performing above grade level, is about 35 percent. And given these disparate results, my question to the board is, can you give assurances to parents that the grades that their children are receiving on the report cards are accurate ref reflections of their academic pro uh, pro uh, progress. Thank you. Thank you. Number six. Good evening. I feel really unprepared, as they all had a bunch of data um, in their presentations, but I just kind of did this on a spur. So I, my name is Holly Freeman. I am a mother of a student at Madison High School, but I also um, work in a different district as an LCDC, which is an addiction counselor. Um, I provide addiction counseling to, and education on substance use to kids who are in alternative and um, high school, middle school. Um, my concern is the smoker's paradise that has now popped up right across from Madison High School, and I'm sure that there's tons of other ones in our district. Um, it's such easy access, and it doesn't make sense to me that um, a strip club can't operate within a thousand feet of a school. I wouldn't think a smoke shop should be able to either. Um, our kids are in our real danger. Um, you can have anything put in these vapes today, fentanyl, meth, crack, I mean all of it. And, and your kid can get away just walking around smoking it in the school. And they're so easy to, to hide. Um, those smoke shops aren't carting these kids when they go in a lot of the times. 
So it, it's just, it's really dangerous. Thank you. Thank you. Item eight, presentations A, intruder detection audit, Dr. Micah. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam President. As we discussed uh, in closed session this evening, there were 11 schools that went uh, through a safety audit um, from the Texas School Safety Center auditors. Of those, 10 were clean, one had a finding. Um, there was nothing to address other than my statement this evening, which would be, again, I, 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 we've done videos, um, we've continued to push out information. Folks, when you leave our buildings, please make sure the school door uh, behind you closes students, staff, parents, all of the above. It's imperative that we're all working together to make certain that those doors are locked and remain locked. So when you walk out your door, just make sure that, don't, don't listen to the click, turn around and take a second to make sure that door is closed. That's all, thank you. Item nine, Item nine superintendent comments. That's right, thank you. Um, so we've got a few things tonight. First, congratulations to Reagan High School sophomores Yala Patel and Carolina Furtick. These young ladies recently finished third overall at the state UIL CX debate contest, bringing home the bronze medal. NEISD, you may have seen, is the winner of the 2024 It's Time Texas Community Challenge. After weeks of teachers, parents, and employees logging points for physical fitness and healthy eating habits, NEISD finished first place in the Metro School District category. Last week, very late, we just learned that Bradley Middle School Jazz Band has been invited to perform at the 78th Midwest Clinic in Chicago in December. This is a tremendous honor and a once in a lifetime for most directors and programs. These invitations are reserved for only the most talented bands and orchestras in the nation. So congratulations to them. And then uh, the Northeast Special Olympics Track and Field Tournament at Hero Stadium is always a day filled with excitement and celebration. This year, we had 581 Special Olympic athletes compete in our track and field meet, and each athlete had a middle or high school PAL student assigned to them to be their buddy for the day. We could not host events of this magnitude without the support of our PALS program, staff, parents, and our Special Olympic. This year was different, and it's special because we held our inaugural NEISD Special Olympics Medal Design Contest. For our inaugural NEISD Fiesta Medal Contest, we had 70 entries. Those entries came from elementary, middle, and high school Olympians. We asked for our contestants to capture the spirit of NEISD Special Olympics and San Antonio's tradition of Fiesta, which our winner highlighted them both into one medal. And as you see in the bag in front of you, you actually have a medal that is provided to you. At this time, I would like Brandon Esquivel. Can Brandon, can you stand up for us? This is the young man who designed our medal. And I believe with Brandon this evening is his mother and his dad and Principal Curry, correct? Do y'all mind? Yeah. So congratulations, Brandon. It's an amazing medal. You did a great job. And I will proudly wear this. So thank you all for coming this evening and letting us recognize Brandon. Thank you, Brandon.
That is all, Madam President. Thank you. Wait, wait, wait. You forgot uh -oh. something. This is really, really important. Um, okay. Almost elementary um, school, and they won the Gold Ribbon Award. Uh, Miss Gayla Booth was, um, I read about it in the newspaper, and I was all excited because this was the only NEISD school that actually won this award. Yes. Oh. Yes. And I got all excited because it's in my district. So. <laughs> Anything else? All right, sure. Item 10, report on required board training. A state board rule on board member continuing education announcement of credit. Under state board of education rule, completing required continuing education each year of service is a basic obligation and expectation of any sitting board member. As board president, I'm required to announce the name of each member who has completed the required continuing education, has exceeded the required continuing education, education or is deficient in meeting it um, so please let the minutes reflect that um, Shannon Grona, Sandy Huey, David Byer, Steve Hilliard, Marsha Landry and Diane Skiba Villarreal have all met or exceeded the required continuing education hours to the extent applicable um, as required. Yay! Yay. And if you'd like for me to read everything that we've done, I'd be happy to do that, but um, I don't think that that's necessary. Item, sorry, 11, board business. A, discussion and possible action regarding School Health Advisory Council Shack's ad hoc committee proposed survey and survey recipients. So we were, um, there's a recommendation, right, from the ad hoc committee. Dr. Dr. Oh. Broom is actually oh, here okay. this yeah. evening. We invite in case there are any questions from the trustees, so all the trustees to ask if there are questions. Well, thank you all, and uh, Lori Pitch is also here with us today. She, she and I are kind of co-chairing this committee. Um, we submitted a list of questions that we've kind of come up with, and, and it's, it's pretty basic, but just, you know, who we thought from the district should be surveyed and what questions to ask. And, and we started with three pages worth of stuff, and we tried to really summarize that down into something that's not only easy to administer, but easy to gather the data on. It's very short and sweet. Do you all have a copy of it? in front of you okay I, I, rather than reading it out loud i just i mean we went from how do we meet the teaks how do we allocate hours what if we do this way what if we do that way you, you know can we meet all of our ap course requirements or our cte requirements do we have teacher every and we felt like we could get everything sort of condensed into hopefully these that would give pertinent information we're meeting weekly um we're interviewing staff members um we hope very quickly as, as as much as possible to get all the data that we need to take it to the full shack for a vote if there's any questions from you guys uh feel free to ask or, or any advice to with open arms we'll take it so okay thank you did anybody have any questions or comments about the um staff that they had identified to send the survey to or the questions um, I was just wondering um, I know that we're considering sending the you know the questions to the health teachers and it kind of doesn't make much sense because this is something that you know we're considering that's their position it's kind of a you know wouldn't it be better uh, to send it, I, I can't find my notes. I've got so much stuff over here, but I believe, you know, just because it's kind of like asking somebody, well, how important do you think you are in this particular scheme of things? And of course, naturally, they're going to say, yeah, my position is very important. This, um, so is that, um, is that something that, you know, we really should be sending to them? Is that necessary? Uh, I think it's important that all voices get heard. We, they're, you know, let them uh, each answer the survey as well. I don't think, in my opinion, um, I have no problem with the six different categories. The one question I had was the number of characters. For the parent survey, we did 250 words. This was four to 500. 
I don't know if there was a reason y'all wanted a bigger word number or y'all just picked up a number. I, that was, um, part of that was for, because it was really hard to cram everything into all well, the 100 words. Maybe but, we want four or 500 for yeah, some, of yeah. the, some of the folks. I'm okay with that. I just, that was my only question I had. Um, understand your point, Ms. Villarreal, but I think it's important that we hear all voices because if I understand this, they'll identify their position um, in that. So we'll kind of know, and, um, but it's good to hear their voice as well, in my opinion. Oh, I agree. I agree. I was just asking for yeah. a friend. But no, I just, I can, you know, I, I want to hear from everybody, but I don't know um, what this is going to involve, how, you know, detailed this is going to be, so. I well, I think uh, would... uh, to the responses to the questions, I think we, I, I did hear on the parent survey, the hundred, we did a hundred words in a couple spots. 250. Well, there were a couple that, yeah, it was too short. Um, and so I think, especially in this situation, in this context, especially with educators that are dealing with this on a daily basis i think that if we got up to 500 words it's probably a good because i think Ms. villarreal that could give some context if you have a health teacher that they may have opinions one way or the other but they can give some extra wording to maybe support or um, or to support their answer and gives you more context than to say okay well they just answered this one click, you know, drop down menu, but now I understand with a couple of sentences where they're coming from. And that just makes sense. Give, that, give, that's give much better. Yes. The, the only, I guess, question I have, if you don't mind if I jump in, Madam President, sorry, no, <laughs> started right. talking. Um, so that question three um, <clears throat> says, do students at your campus have difficulty fitting health class into their schedule? The only, uh, the concern I have with that is that um, you could have one teacher, one counselor, a principal, you know, the family specialist, whoever it is, that could answer that both ways because they could have some students they know that um, can fit it in and they have other students that can't fit it in. And, and I'm, I guess my concern is that that question seems to assume that that's the issue with the health class. And so what, I've, what I'm wondering is if there's a way that that can be worded to get a similar response but maybe talk, and I don't know what the question is, but to talk more about the value of the class or the benefit of the class or, or something of that nature, whether it's pros or cons to the class and not just say, well, can you fit it in your schedule? Because I know that that is one of the questions we ask parents, um, but I think from a campus perspective, they're gonna have both answers to that. We, that went round and round because there was yeah. some of this was, do you have trouble allocating the resources for this? Do you have, you know, do you have complaints from parents that are saying it's too hard to fit it in or we can't take more summer school? Like, right. you know, and there's so many iterations and then do you make it six questions or do you, and, and, and what, all we were trying with this is to get it down to one. It, you know, oh man, the wording is tough. We, we kind of went Absolutely. with this because we thought it was just kind of, uh, it's strict air it's to the point enough to get some valuable but it's yeah. vague enough to also kind of catch all viewpoints there and it may be one of these things where and it, this is it's a recommendation to you guys to do what you feel best sure. with it but yeah. it may be this is only this question or the way it's worded is is better suited for say principals and directors different wording maybe for somebody else a little bit it may be more valuable and but that just and and the, and the goal well, of curious, keeping maybe, it short and sweet oh, I no, it's okay. I, I think I wonder if a way to get that same response is to kind of have just an open-ended prompt mm -hmm. that allows them to go in and, and type a couple of sentences of, I've seen both happen, or I've seen it come this way, or I've seen it go this way, and not specifically ask them to choose yes or no, um, because I, I think that that, again, I would, I'd be hard-pressed to think that there's a health teacher that had, had, doesn't have both perspectives, and maybe they can argue both perspectives in their answer. I um, think the the comment so, section is critical there because then that's correct. where you can get everyone's perspective. Um, um, so I just I just don't necessarily want to because we are doing a fact finding mission. You guys are meeting every week and doing a a lot of the hard lifting <laughs> trying to get us some recommendations, and so I, I want to make sure that we're um, again. I don't know what that wording is, but I just don't want to lead people to say um, that. This, this is the primary reason that people can't, uh, or that are maybe looking for a waiver or an option to help. Um, but I don't, I, and, and maybe it's, again, maybe it's just leaving it as a free response area and, and kind of having something worded like this um, 
wrong, and I did not. I, I racked my brain over the weekend trying to figure out a way to word it. I even went to Chat GPT. And <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. It's a great. I'm gonna, I'm gonna see if they can prompt me to figure out how to ask this question. Well, so. the, one of the the thoughts on this was: Do students at your campus, or as you know, from a principal and and director standpoint? Somehow to add in wording there, make it make it a little bit of a run-on sentence. But do you have trouble allocating the resources to accommodate students, and or do you feel students are having trouble fitting this into your schedule? Because that might be a little more specific, and still adding comments because I mean, sure. without asking a bunch of po different yeah. pointed questions, it's hard to capture all that. Yeah. But that if that if I'm if I'm on the same page with you, maybe kind of what you're getting at. I think that sounds uh, more along the lines of because I it's it's. As you, I'm sure you all are finding, I'm sure it's data all over the place about mm -hmm. what this issue potentially is. And so I think that gives a little bit more flexibility in, in what it is, how they can answer, or what might be pertinent to them at that time. And then when that info comes back to us, then we can say, okay, well, this, this group is really concerned with resources. This group is concerned with scheduling. This group is concerned with whatever. So I think that gives, um, if we can add or rephrase yeah. it to more like that, I think I'd, I can, I'd be more are, comfortable. Um, why couldn't we just add it as another question? I mean, we, we, we could certainly could. Oh, I could do that. We, that no, could be a no, two-part question. The, uh, the direction we had was we had six in ours. Our goal was not to have 20 or 30. They, sure. We had them. They, they actually knocked it down more than I thought they were going to, honestly. But, that but was, I mean, let's just add that as a question. I, that's, that's fine. I mean, yeah. 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 And then that way, please be specific if it's resource allocation is the issue. So please spell out in your comments what it is. But yeah. yeah add as, that as, as opposed to trying to make it two-folded. Yeah, just add a fourth question. Because I think that's also what heard from the parent, yep. we were folding too many questions into, and we, yeah. we'll yeah. get into that another time, but right. yeah, I, I think that'd be fine. I was gonna say, I really appreciate just the brevity of this because I did hear a lot of comments <laughs> about the other survey. It's very hard, when, and when you, you have to leave some comment boxes, right? But the, and especially for the parent one that, that's already gone out, when you let everyone add comments, it takes so much manpower to get what you need out of that. So it, hopefully this will keep it I have to a the question. Point. Okay. Um, first of all, how does having health, you know, being mandatory actually help this district? I mean, we're right now we're facing a, a budgetary shortfall and, um, and I'm just wondering if maybe we could pose a question, you know, to the people, because I know that our, you know, our current teachers, it was explained to me by somebody that the teachers that it, let's say we decided health was not going to be mandatory anymore, and we move those teachers to another position. Um, somebody, I can't remember, one of my teacher friends, you know, told me that essentially you can get recertified into something else, and it can be even something over a weekend, and we could actually move that uh, teacher into another position that we have a shortfall, because I've also, uh, been speaking to some parents and they were talking to me and telling me that they have the, the things called pathways. Do I have this correctly? Pathways to the different, um, and some, and they're being told that they can't go or they can't actually meet all the pathways because there are teachers that are not going to be back um, in their, their, that class is not going to be taught and so, but they were trying to figure out how to do it. So I'm just wondering if maybe we could somehow roll that into some kind of a question where, you know, maybe um, the, those teachers that we had over here, if they would just get certified in something else, we could roll them into that next, you know, position. One, Is that possible? Is one it? thought we had on that, and just see if this changes your thinking, because I mean, we, you, it's your call, but it's, um, we're in some of the people that we're interviewing, we've invited Mr. Jarrett next week, and we wanted to ask a lot of these curriculum questions to, to you know, directly to him and get some feedback from a district, you know, and on, on more of those, that line of, th of thinking, at some of this we're hoping to get data out of interviewing different people and compiling Metro Health data and seeing if there are trends. That's, that's one of the goals of this too, uh, that may, may or may not specifically get it. We could. Could know. we ask the health teacher, since we are going to be asking them questions, if you are a health teacher, would you be willing to take another certification and move into a different position if that was necessary? Is that a way to... I think that's getting a little ahead of ourselves. 
Oh, I know, but I'm just opinion. saying because I know that there's a lot of fear out there where people feel like they're going to be displaced. Well, I think that a question like that might stoke that fear, fear because we're, might, we're, yeah, we're, okay. we're, now, we're now we're assuming that something's going to change drastically where they'd be looking for a new job. And I, and I, I would be really opposed to doing that. Well, I understand. Point. I was just trying to, because I know that there's been a lot of, you know, every time like somebody said, you know, when we sneeze, the entire, you know, district gets a cold. So I know that there's been a lot of, you know, fear out there. And, um, I just, I didn't want people to feel like we were trying to displace them. I, I don't like it when people feel fear, and I don't like it when they feel like they're being, you know, tossed aside. And I didn't know how to allay that, you know, that fear. Because that's not what we're trying to do. Yeah, and, and I think when, if, if we have sort of the survey as it is with kind of asking that resource question that was mentioned, and then I, I mean, we're gonna have a, pretty large discussion about this at some point. And I think, I think I'd like, from my, from my opinion, the ad hoc committee to be able to finish their interviews with educators. Mm -hmm. And then before we jump into asking questions, I think right now the questions are general enough to where they can get some pretty quick feedback um, from the administrators, the teachers, the counselors, family specialists, while the ad hoc committee is interviewing people that are working on this every day. Um, and then that data can kind of get put together, and then, I mean, we're going to have a long meeting uh, at some I point. I would agree. <laughs> we're more in the information gathering stage right, right. now. That's a discussion that we'll have depending on how things come out, and we'll see where it goes and what type of conversation it needs to be. Um, but I get the point you're making just to make sure people aren't worried about that. But I do think adding maybe that fourth question would probably be the cleanest way versus having a run on if everyone else was in agreement. Because yeah. part of the tasking after I met with Dr. Micah and Ms. Moore was, sent the ad hoc just let them know our board meeting date because obviously they're on a timeline and we're on a timeline so they were able to continue i was actually surprised y'all got questions this fast i thought it was going to be the next board meeting so thank y'all but the goal is that timely so dr mike and the staff can get the survey built out back and then the ad hoc can continue to look at the data um, was kind of the goal because of the timing of our board meetings um, and board corporate making these decisions so i'm good with adding a fourth question um in yeah, these people I think we all are right. Is you, agree everyone good with that? that? So yeah, I can reword it and send and email it back out, and, and ultimately it'd be all you guys sending it out. So we if, just if, send that out and at least start the wording, and hopefully you don't have to edit it as much. Um, yeah, that sounds and okay. Mr. Bryan, you just want to restate, or do we just want to state it out loud now, and then we can type yeah, it up just, later? Let's just word. Because so then we can. So my yeah. recommendation would be to iron it out. Yeah. Because if you don't adopt and right. vote tonight right. on it, then we're going to delay it. That's what I would like to get. So, so I'd like you to. Do it. We can follow up with the typed words later, but let's get the verbal now that we yes, all agree to. Yes, sir. I agree with that. Dr. Broom, could you repeat my question to you? So you can <laughs> like I think it, you, it was more, uh, more along the lines of, it, it, as the fourth question, because question three is, do your students have difficulty fitting health in their schedule? Question four could be, do you have difficulty allocating resources to accommodate health and schedules? I can uh, Does that, I mean, yeah, that, right. that's, that is correct. That's because I think that's getting on the different topics okay. that, we've, that we're looking yeah. for. Okay, yep. so those will be the four. That's the wording of the four. We all agree to that, correct? Okay, Agreed. so do I have a motion to approve this, um, the survey, who it's going to be sent to, and what the four questions are? So moved, Madam President. Do I have a second? Second. second. Is there any more discussion, Dr. May, may I enter? <laughs> so the only thing is, can because again, it's it's by action, right? So when when do you all want this to go out? And then the other thing I'd like y'all to, to say is, who do you want the, the results to go to? And like, so I wrote this, send to the, so do you all want us to send it to the ad hoc committee? And can they tell us, the ad hoc committee, how they would like their data? I just don't wanna slow this process down. So you can say to me tonight, look, you know, We'll go with whatever the ad hoc committee wants as far as the data. We'll get it, and then if we want something further, we'll we can come to a board meeting and ask for it. I just don't want this to slow down any. I'm trying to expedite it, and I don't want to leave this evening. And it, so you know, Dr. Broom and who I'm sorry, who is the other Mrs. coach? Miss Fitch. Miss Fitch. Fitch. Yep. They can work with that, and you guys can say, hey, here's how we want our data, and this is, and that way, then I've got the direction to go forth tomorrow and get this done. 
D does that make sense? Yeah, I, and I, um, because we tasked the ad hoc committee with sort of coming up with this, and, and we didn't necessarily do it, um, I would I would feel comfortable letting them <laughs> tell the district how they want that data, and then I would assume that Maybe. if we needed something more, that the district would have that available if we needed Cor to dig into something that we Great. felt was correct. That that's my point, Mr. Byers. We can give so them what them they need to have for their decision making. They can kind of ask Miss Moore, "Hey, we'd like our data like this. She'll send it to us. We'll give it to them, yeah. and then we'll send you all a copy as well, so that you can see what went to ad hoc." And then should you all as a board want something deeper, then at a future board meeting, you can talk about it. Does that make sense? I'm, I'm just trying to keep it moving right. for y'all. That's yep. all. I agree. Okay. You can do that. Okay, could I uh, get who, who was the second? Because we had a couple of voices going. Okay. All right. Is there any other discussion on this? <coughs> and, um, and we can send this out as soon as we can get it prepared, correct? Yes. You guys yes. are good with that? Yes. Okay. Because we've got we've done the wording of all the questions, and we know who it's going to. All right. Anything else? So I have a motion and a second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. The motion carries. Thank you, Dr. Broom and yeah. Ms. Fitch. Okay. Thank you all. Okay. Um, item B: Discussion and possible action regarding data analysis of health survey. So that's to your point of what to do with that. Co correct, data. Madam so President. It, it, that's my thing. Is as a as a board. We can give you what you want, but I just need to know, and again, this was just something, that's why I jumped in on A. I just want to make sure that I know what, what it is that y'all want, and then should you want something more as a board, then you see, I just don't, I don't want, because um, you guys have to act as, a, as, a, as an entity, right? Right. I'm trying to, to make sure we can keep this moving. Okay. So the results are all, the survey results are all back, correct? So now it's how do we want that data given to us? Right. Because right. So I mean, we can slice and dice this data in a variety of ways. Okay. It's like, so we can give you a simple report that just is like a pie chart or percentages, like, hey, here are your questions and here's the percentages. We can give it to you by uh, SMD. We can give it to you by all sorts. We can okay. give it to you by, we want to know how did sixth grade or sixth grade parents respond? How did seventh grade work? Like, how do you want the data, and then we'll just create that for you. I do think it would be interesting to see by maybe cluster, how that. If not, I would just say if it's easier, just do it by each high school and middle school, because yeah. that way okay. I'd just even keep it clean, because obviously some of the clusters mm -hmm. over, you know, the S and D's overcut. So okay. I would just say do it by each high school and the the 14 middle schools, and split it that way. Okay. So the first like one. here's how. So y you have Reagan High School. So here's how Reagan High School answered, Lopez. And yeah. Bush, and then Madison, Harris, yep. Wood, and so you'd see it broken out. Do, do you all want it in its totality? I think that's a good oversight because that's the big picture, and then we can okay. just see where you know percentage of responses, and then where it went. That's okay. my opinion. And then as far as the open-ended responses, I mean, we're just going to give to you right. a big long list of yeah. everything. Yeah, that's okay. Don't, don't be doing more for that. No, just, because it's there's a lot. And so that would really slow it down. Or were you just fine with us sending it to you and saying, here you go? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So okay. we'll see middle school and high school. Correct. Right. So we'll give it to okay. you. So what I understand, so I'm repeating this, Mr. Byer. Okay. So we'll do overall as a district, and then we'll do it by individual high school. Okay. Then we will do it by individual middle school. Okay. And that's how you'll get your data. Just, raw, just percentages or a pie chart, whatever is easy. Is that fine? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there any, does anybody there want any else? other kind of desegregation? No, just for each of the schools, can we show like the total enrollment versus total responses just for that piece of it? I'm sure that'll be probably be included in there, but you know, we'll see that. No, that. so that's fine. That's good. That's what because, I mean. Because I mean, so I don't, I just want to hear, you know, Lopez Middle School, we had 35% say yes, 65% say no, sure. and it was 10 people versus it was Absolutely. out of 1,200 people. It so, was so, so, so for number of per, for so per campus, you want enrollment, and then number of respondents, and then the number of respondents. Please, that would be perfect. Because that thank you puts context to the yes, data. sir. Okay, what else? Do we need a motion on that, or just? Yeah. Well, I'm just okay. wondering if there's any okay. other. Um, and is that so when it's broken out, the enrollment for the grade specific? 
for the overall enrollment for each school? I think that's what he's asking. I believe it's been, it's how, been how would you like by, it? By school and not I, by I was saying level. by school, yeah. not down to the grade level, but I mean, that's my opinion. You can't get down to the grade level, uh, um, but I don't know if that's, if we want to do, I mean, I, I'm not sure if you're thinking like what is sixth grade parent versus seventh grade versus eighth grade parents. Right, and that's what we initially had discussed when we wrote the survey and um, delineated how the questions would go. Um, is there, is it possible, Dr. Micah, to have a summary that um, Mr. Hilliard had requested and then um, a link to the raw data in the background um, that we can look at? So it's in a program called Qualtrics. I'm not, I mean, we could give it to you, but we probably have to teach you how to, I mean, it's not. Can it be exported to Excel? Um, oh, it'd be a well, large Are you, is it, is are it, you, are you wanting it because you want it sixth grade, and so, so maybe we just have it dial down and say this yep. is sixth well, grade, seventh grade, eighth grade. Well, and I don't want everybody. Yeah, I mean. With, well, how, yes, how much I, harder is that? Um, or is, or maybe if. Well, here, here's what I would say. So to go back to, to what Dr. Broom uh, was stating and we were talking about earlier, the more in-depth we get, just understand the longer it's gonna take to produce you results. Mm -hmm. And so maybe uh, if I could say, let's do something relatively along what Mr. Hilliard was talking about, get it, and then if you say, you know what, I think I'd like a little more, then we can hit that way. Then you get something to look at right now, so that we're not. And, and I'm fine with that. But just the, having. Sure. I, I just I, if I, the answer is I don't know. I think if it exports out into um, Excel, because there were about 27, 2800 responses, you're going to be looking at a very large file with all those pieces. Does that? With all that, I mean, it's going to be big. Well, and Mrs. Larry, I'm not sure it'll go through. <laughs> well, Mrs. Larry, if we get all of this, this initial, if not, we have a board meeting in two weeks. We can always add that and say we want an additional. Cor correct. From the that's admin. that's what I can get you this to start with, and then if you're, you know, looking at it and say, you know what, we, then in two weeks we've got we can put it on, and then you can say I'd like some more, and then we can get at least you have something right now. I like pie charts. Okay, <laughs> that's fine. I like data. <laughs> I like pie charts. <laughs> so so. Okay, anything else? No, I mean, keep going. I, I, I don't wanna, uh, I but mean, what, you, I'm, it, my thing is, is again, so, you know, folks, we got two people that do this, and, and they've, got a lot, they've got some other stuff to do, so that's why I'm saying, that's like, I wanna give you something, but I can deep dive into it, but the, the, the more granular we get, the slower it's gonna move, and the, the, the slower I'm gonna get it to you. So I can give you the first iteration of what you just talked about tonight, and then if you don't like it, we'll we'll get another stab well, at and it. And I don't want to ex extend the process, but in my mind, the things that we're looking to answer is is health class value added, or do parents want it as a high school credit? Can it be moved to a eighth grade credit, mm -hmm. and can it be um, affected by a waiver? So, and I think you're going to see that with the report that we were discussing earlier. You think it's that? Clear? Yes, yes, ma'am. Okay. I've seen at least a high level view of it. I think it's pretty clear. Okay. Okay. And I'll take your word. And I think when you see level. the data, I think you will understand why I say it's pretty clear. All right. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. So, do I have a motion to? Um, did anybody write down? I, I, I got it. The, the motion, I'll make the motion, Madam President, if that's okay with you. Request the data by uh, individual campus, both high school and middle school, with total enrollment versus number of respondents broken out in a reasonable pie chart or bar graph, whatever makes the easiest um, for the initial response. Um, that way we have it by campus um, across the entire district for middle school and high school. Okay, do I have a second? Right, with, with one slide given one, all, in, with all the aggregate in one with the total, together. yes. Yes, sir. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Give it to her. It was David. It was David. It was oh, David. him. Her. Sorry. Yeah. Him. Him. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. 
Okay, item C, presentation, discussion, and possible action regarding district level paperwork requirements. We had someone sign up to speak to this. Number four. Number four. Good evening, Madam President, board members, Dr. Micah, executive staff, and guests. Um, I, my name is Deborah Parrish, and I was a resource, G, it, later the name was changed to GEC teacher, in Texas public schools for 32 years, starting in the mid-1970s. In the 70s, a regular classroom teacher had one document to fill out to get the referral process started. It was a screening uh, page, and it was just, you checked off the things that fit the student. Um, and it was to be a tool if they thought a student should be referred for special, possibly for special education testing. By the time I retired in 2007, there were at least 25, at least 25 pages that the referring teacher had to fill out on such a student before the child was finally tested by a diagnostician. I would like to recommend that a teacher is having to do such paperwork be given 45 minutes per week as long as needed and with the understanding that this is 45 minutes to work on that paperwork during the school day to do that and work on those referral uh, documents uh, in the schools I worked in, teachers had a 45-minute planning period, but usually you've got plenty of other stuff you have to do during that 45-minute planning period. I'm talking an additional 45-minute planning period once a week where there is a, a, a regular sub comes in and goes for 45 minutes to this person who's filling out referral papers and then 45 minutes to this person who's filling out referral papers the teachers who were referring know what's going on and are prepared to get their stuff together and get the information down in writing that they need. So the teachers just baby, just, just, I didn't mean to say that, but the teacher, the sub is just going from class to class so that there is a sub for that extra 45 minutes within the school day that the, that the referring teacher can have to fill out all those papers. Um, um, and as soon as all of the documenting, documentation preparation time, uh, as soon as all the documents are prepared and the next step is this child's ready for a diagnostician, then that extra 45 minutes would no longer be available to that teacher unless they were starting on a new referral. Um, um, but the idea of this, of this substitute being hired to just go class to class for 45 minutes. I had some students that were not, once it became oh, acute. I'm sorry, that's sorry. your time. Okay, uh, is this Mr. Jarrett? Mr. Jarrett. Okay, thank, thank you, Madam President. I'm actually gonna ask the executive directors for curriculum instruction to come forward to go over these paperwork items. What I will say, um, the items that are listed in this presentation, as the best of our ability in the time that we had, we tried to put everything in here. Um, so we believe is an exhaustive list, but we're not as confident just because of the timing that we had to complete this. And so if there's something that we're missing that is overwhelming our teachers that someone is aware of, we would love to know so we can uh, look into that deeper. So we're pleased to bring you tonight an update on department paperwork and documentation required by federal, state, and local expectations, noting that this may change if legislative requirements change um, or if local requirements change. So we wanted to just make that note. So here are the essential questions we pursued um, based on the expectations for teachers, counselors, librarians, and administrators. And these were questions posed by our board. And so this is how we proceeded with bringing that information to you. One thing we thought was critical to share was the change in enrollment and student population. So you'll, you'll notice at the top of the screen, we have our total student population, and it's showing a, a decrease from last year. So our overall student enrollment decreased since 22-23. 
but each of our special program areas for 504 dyslexia are emergent bilingual students in special education who receive special program services um, have increased in that same time period from 22-23 to 23-24. So we just wanted to note that. That comes with implications around expectations, things we have to document around each of the special programs and specific types of meetings and committees that have to happen, and we'll share that with you as we proceed. So good evening. First, we'll share um, the documentation and paperwork that's required with the most consistent basis for elementary teachers. So we do have kinder and pre-kindergarten checklists for reporting, grade reporting, as well as uh, first through fifth grade grade reporting once every nine weeks. Um, in addition to uh, early reading inventory screeners at the beginning of the year, there is a parent letter that goes out as well for text Kia. Um, in addition, uh, we do have both state requirement and NEIC program requirements for accelerated instruction plans, AIPs, or accelerated education plans as well, AEPs, and those are as needed and include parent notification as well. Um, also included on here is student reports uh, regarding discipline procedures. So you'll notice for secondary teachers, all of those same categories exist as expectations for secondary with the addition of science lab safety training that's required by the standards for um, secondary science. So on this slide, we combined uh, requirements for documentation for both elementary and secondary administrators. So at the beginning of the year prior to October, there is a submission of teachers who require an ESL waiver or bilingual exception, um, as well as attending LPACs, which are language proficiency assessment committee meetings at the beginning of the year, middle of year, and end of year as students enter as well. MTSS behavior plans, so which is an NEIC requirement, are submitted at the beginning of the year. Uh, discipline procedures as well, budgeting, and then um, AEPs, accelerated education plans for age. HB 1416. So secondary administrators and elementary administrators have the additional expectation in this documentation where you notice the fourth line discipline. There are time requirements um, related to the documentation that's necessary when recommending a placement for a student. So that's an additional expectation that administrators are under. One, one second. What, what is MTSS? Multi-tiered systems of support. It is the system you build on a campus to ensure that interventions are happening for academic and behavioral supports for all students. Thank you. Yes, sir. So when we look at the expectations for our emergent bilingual teachers, both elementary and secondary, we do have an expectation once in nine weeks to understand where students are and what they might need linguistically to accommodate and support their progression moving forward in, in uh, gaining the uh, language that they are acquiring. And of course, as Dr. Muskis mentioned, LPAC, so the a committee coming together, including a parent, to understand and make change and support at the beginning, middle, and end of the year what a student might need and what might change in their programmatic supports. My apologies. I have a cough drop, so if you see me, with, yeah, that's, that's what it is. I don't want to be coughing in front of everybody. I apologize. Um, so for our librarians, we do have our impact report. That's a quarterly report that is surrounded by um, instructional supports that they are providing uh, during specials. This is from elementary all the way through secondary. Um, purchase order requests, material processing forms, some of those are both um, local requirements and a federal requirement as well. We have collaborative team action planning, which is also part of our local requirements through PLC processes to make sure that our librarians are um, on target instructionally. And then we also want to be able to provide a self-report or a self-reflection document. Um, that is also tied to state requirements. That is not just a local requirement. Requirement. We also have a contractor packet that is a federal requirement as well for all author visits and presenters. For our counselors at the elementary uh, setting, we do have our counselor time tracker. That is a TEA requirement that came as of recent um, with the 80-20 ruling. Um, they have asked us to be able to provide some sort of documentation as they're still in the process of fleshing out what the 80-20 is going to look like. Um, we do have Skyward office visits that are a requirement for a local requirement to be able to track the office visits that students are um, undergoing with their counselor to be able to support regardless of whether the student is a mobile student or not. Uh, we have transcript audits that are both TEA and local. We have crisis protocol documentation, small group and individual counselor visits with permission slips. Those are both TEA and NEISD. And then we have testing documentation if the counselor is a campus testing coordinator and 504 documentation if the counselor is a 504 coordinator for the campus. 
Um, middle and high do have very similar pieces when it comes to the, the time tracker, the office visits, but if you go down to the bottom, it does have the intensive program of instructions for those students or those seniors that are off track, off cohort from their graduation. They have to have a very individualized approach to be able to catch up with their cohort. We also have individual graduation plans that are tied to TEA requirements when any student has failed more than two or three EOCs. They need to be able to meet those requirements as well. And then we also have dual credit documentation that is both a CCMR uh, documentation requirement and it's also tied to our um, legal requirements that we have uh, that are binding through the district and any IHE that we have a partnership with. Regarding special education, looking at elementary versus secondary, it's the same across all levels. We are responsible for two different laws for IDEA, and they're both federal laws in Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. Underneath both of those umbrellas, um, the paperwork varies. It doesn't vary by campus, it varies by elementary versus secondary, and the time commitment also varies. It depends on the experience of the teacher, is it, is it a teacher that's new to NEISD, or are there, are there some other concerns, the needs of students, particularly looking at elementary versus secondary. There are extra components for secondary because we're, we are helping them prepare for post-secondary as we saw by the three students who were here earlier. Can I ask a quick question? Mm -hmm. Say an average teacher who's been here for a couple of years, what is that average extra time commitment? Because I mean, always there's gonna be variation based on the individual, but what are we talking, are we talking 30 minutes, are we talking three hours? What it's, are, what, it's really hard to say, it really depends. It, it truthfully depends on their level of experience, whether it's somebody we have to continually coach. So they have, have you, time you, built you, into the school day to okay, be able to do that. Okay, you've done it before, you've done the paperwork before? So I have. How long would it take you to do it when you're experienced? Um, I'm just saying, honestly, sorry, it just, it just really depends. It just right. depends on whether it's a student that has different, has there's change in accommodations, a change in modifications. Is it kiddo that's going from fifth grade to sixth grade? Now we're starting to talk about transition. There's a lot of different factors that go into that. Can you give me a range? I mean, the time requirement is a real discussion here because of teacher workload and extra burden. So we're trying to understand that. So I understand there's always going to be variation, but we need to have, that was one of the big questions is what is that extra time requirement? I could probably compile some of that for you if that's what you're looking for versus just giving, I, I would, it would be difficult for me to say it took me two hours to do an ARD because I've been doing it for so long. Mm -hmm. But you bring in a new system, it might take me four while I'm figuring it out. But as soon as I figure that out, it might take me an hour. So I can gather that information for you, but it's really hard just to say. I understand where you're coming from, but it's really hard just to say. It takes this amount of time because there, we have so many different levels of staff members in North uh, understood. East that it's a huge, it's a huge dream. But we have staff members that come in on the backside and help coach them through that and help them complete the paperwork as well. No one's ever on their own. I understand that, but so are we talking, I mean, can you give me any sort of time thing for, say you're doing an ARD uh, for a three or four year teacher who's done this a couple of years? I mean, are we talking, three hours once a semester, we're talking every quarter. Their, their art know. is annual, right? so it's it's annually. But, but the interim work to get all the track, the paperwork for the art, right? It depends on a lot of factors. I understand what you're saying, but it could be, depends on how long it takes a gen ed teacher to give them information. So, so we're, let me, let me just kind of jump in here. So I think the factors is what you need to get to, and then he needs an answer in the sense of how long does it mm -hmm. take to input the information mm -hmm. into the system? So the system where mm -hmm. the arts are created some things are pre-populated and then some things are entered by the special right. education person. So this list, and then I'll get your answer that you're, you're seeking. This list right here depends on all these factors kicking mm -hmm. in to get the information entered. His question that he's just asking, that person, when they're filling it out, how mm -hmm. long does it take to complete their part of the art? Right, they obviously get to a lot of inputs, but when they're doing it, because we're looking at, once again, we're trying to reduce mm -hmm. the admin burden where possible. Obviously, there's federal requirements, state requirements we have to meet, but where is the area is that, and then what does it look like? How much time? I would say talking? probably two hours for an annual art, but that includes all the things on the screen. So if you look, you have a diagnostician involved. It could be a student receive speech services, admins piece, data you're gathering from gen ed. So the time it takes to gather all that information and then put that into the system where, as Mr. Jared stated, we have purposeful um, support for them. So they're just not inputting everything. There are drop down menus, there's different frameworks for them to utilize based on what's happening with that student. We really tried to cut down on that, and then we have other programs to help them really look at the academic pieces that they can just copy and paste after they've inputted the information. Okay, thank you. Sorry for interrupting. I figured can I ask you a question? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, anything I've ever done, I try to perfect it over time mm -hmm. and narrow things down. Have you ever yes. sat there and just looked at your paperwork and you thought, 
Yes, ma'am. This is redundant and yes, it's ridiculous. We have, we did that actually going into this year. We, we believe we work uh, smarter, not harder. So that's where some of the programs came into place, looking at those drop downs, as he mentioned, all of those pieces, because we want to retain our staff. So we are always looking at that continuous improvement and how we can support them. Yes, ma'am. But have you, do you feel like you've made improvements, but you could go farther with those improvements? Always, there's always room to improve, always. Ms. Villarreal, just some context, um, and this will go back in time, just like the um, speaker said a, little, <coughs> a while ago. There used to be a time all the special education paperwork was done by hand, and you scripted every detail of it, and then you tore the pieces of paper apart, and then you went and put it in everybody's mailbox, and then you still had the teacher class. And so over time, school districts have been adopting various ways through technology to try to expedite the process, i.e. creating systems that can pre-populate information that causes that redundancy. Is it perfect? No. Are we constantly looking? In fact, we moved to a different vendor this year mm -hmm. to try to get to a different place. We have people come in and input information premature or early on so the teachers wouldn't have to do it. So there's a lot of things we try to do, but we do have federal guidelines. And so as these guidelines come our way, we try to, I guess, create systems. But again, it's just like anything else. There's a law for the law, then there's another law that you need to write the script for. So we're just fighting those battles along the way too. One more general question while you're up there, Mr. Jarrett. So emerging bilingual, special ed, 504, and dyslexia, those four categories for an individual student, which one generally takes the most time on the administrative paperwork side? Because I know they're all gonna generally be different, but as a general rule, is one significantly cause more? Because obviously we have 11,000 emerging bilingual, which is a significant number um, pushing 20% of the district students, you know, and then obviously tied to the teachers and their paperwork. But is there one category that takes a lot more than the other? I can say specifically. I see looks back and forth. Well, I'm, I'm grabbing. Yeah, we're, we have different yes. programs. We have different pieces. Yes. So looking specifically at dyslexia and special ed, dyslexia is moving under special ed. That's, that's a new piece of legislation. Okay. So it'd be hard to break those apart. So that's my specific piece and then. Well, and I think also what you see represented is there are committee conversations mm -hmm. happening around documentation. So it's not like mm -hmm. a person is working only in isolation. Mm -hmm. They may have a piece that they may be able to accomplish in a 30 to 45 minute period like they might have for planning, but then a committee comes together and that may take longer to bring all of that together, review data together and make decisions. And so with the growth of population of emergent bilingual students, that means more opportunities to bring the committee around decision making. And it's per student. So if a teacher has multiple students and they're doing that three, four, five times the number students. of students they have. Yes, sir. So that time starts going 45, 30, 45, 30, 45. It's, it's, it just it's, depends it's, on okay. what their needs okay. are. Yeah. Thanks, sorry. Yes, sir. Mr. Hillier, just to summarize, if your, your question is which one takes the longest. Obviously, special education is going to take much more time and preparation because essentially you're taking all of the disabilities and a child can come in with three, four, or five different disabilities and you have to write a very specific plan that has outcomes to meet their IEP goals. So those naturally take more time. The other thing with 504 is that essentially it's the law states every three years that you have to create a plan, but you must review every single year to make sure the accommodations are appropriate. And they've been working through different systems to try to minimize the amount of meetings so that way we do more of a verification, but we also got to make sure we work in partnership with the parents to make sure it aligns to the child's uh, needs. Okay, thanks. So if you can take a look at the chart, so we have an elementary versus a secondary. It really looks at the roles that are on campus, the campus-based roles, and then the itinerant roles that go and provide services on campus. You can see the green is who actually completes the paperwork, the yellow is who provides input. That goes back to that time piece that we're talking about. The people in the yellow provide information, such as how students are doing in the classroom, their grades, how are they interacting with others, and then the person completing it compiles all that, and they're the one that then puts it into the system, okay? And then looking at secondary once again, it's exactly the same with the difference being we're looking at that, that transition piece. There are other pieces that go along with it. We have transition specialists. It's not just on the case manager. We have people that help support that, but it's getting them ready for post-secondary, whether it's NETS, whether it's CTE courses, and they're going to college. Okay. All right. Any other questions at this time? So I guess my real question would be is, so there's always the required stuff, but what specifically does the district add on and who's specifically adding that on that because for the here it says paperwork varies by level elementary and secondary mm -hmm. but not by campus so it's not the principals that are adding mm -hmm. this requirement is this the different offices in central office that are dictating this or who's dictating the 
what the real question is, what's the extra stuff? Because the law, Chapter 11, says paperwork mm -hmm. reduction. So mm -hmm. once again, the federal law, we, there's stuff we have to meet. But what is, what is additional stuff being added locally? And then okay. who's making that decision specifically? So when you look at the chart, I put the elementary because it's, it's bigger and I'm older and it's easier to read, right? Mm -hmm. When you look at the elementary, it's really pared down. It's very, very specific. Those are the pieces of what they're being asked to fill out. But that is, I'm asking, is that, that the That's federal. Level? That's under the federal law. No, no, I'm asking the district. Any Is there any additional district-only requirements is the question I'm asking? No. When, when it comes to special education or, 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 or just pa in general? Pa paperwork in general. This is specific to special education. Sure. But bigger conversation is about paperwork reduction on the teachers. So Obviously, this is some of this is required by sure. law, but we're talking sure. about bigger questions. So I think we'd have to go back to some of the, uh, uh, because, again, the request was a very fast presentation. Yeah. So it, yeah, yeah. it was quick. But can you back? Who's, who's control? Jason, can you back up? Because I think very early on in this slide, we talk about some of the things that we've asked for. Sure. That's, that's the word the question so, I'm asking. So that's that, those are those components of it. So like Mr. Jarrett, like AIP and AEP, that's a state requirement, but it's also a, a Northeast requirement. What's the difference between the two? Correct. So we have to create accelerated education plans, and so that's the state requirement, and then we have to create the documents that they have to complete for us to, to know that the plans are being created. So it becomes a, a two-part. But we're, are we, can we not just use the state form we're having to make? They don't it? have one. So you're making a dupe, so you're having to make your own. So this is where the state's not doing, yeah. or not helping the process. Yeah. Well, and that was going to be part of my question, question is, is like, what, is there a yeah, percentage over what the state or the federal guideline would be that we're having to but it sounds like it's varying states of like well they didn't give us the information yeah. so we had to create the so information so this analysis. rule and it initially started off as four or five 45 45 45 yes, 45 sir. and if you recall it was thrusted upon all districts and said you must do this across the board there was no guidelines as far as here's the documents you use or anything like that and so I testified at, at the legislation to reduce the number of AIPs that they had to create because it was overwhelming our teachers. They came back and they agreed that you can do, I, I don't know if it's three of the five or two of the five, whatever the case is, but they didn't eliminate the, the criteria because they want to make sure the school district across the state is saying, a child struggled and failed, what are you doing about it? And then they want to make sure there's documentation to verify and also in partnership with the parents. And so that rule came out, and then we had to create the document and try to streamline it as best we could. Okay, I, I can I change subjects then? Let's get out of the required state with the emerging bilingual and the special. Let's talk general ed and the other 60 or 50,000, 40,000, no, 35,000 kids. Mm -hmm. are, are there requirements that the district is levying on the average classroom teacher doing that that is above the requirement by law? Are we making teachers do extra paperwork, extra data tracking, extra whatever that is not required is the, the question. Like, and is, if not, it's campus is doing stuff differently. Yeah. So not the required stuff, but extra stuff. Yeah, we, we don't have um, a lot of extra stuff. Only thing that we have is where we ask them to do a multi-tier system of support plan okay. for the campus. And then by student, you do a multi-tier, you basically go through a tier one, tier two, tier three system. Essentially, a child is struggling. You come up with a plan, they move to tier two. That's the real documentation that we asked so we can make sure that we're putting the support in place for those kids. So, and the principals are not asking for extra stuff. Right. Like principal, right. principals have some latitude, right? Well, yeah. no, I mean, it's a serious question because yeah. different campuses we're here and we're doing all this extra stuff and it's not consistent. So yeah. our principals, I have the latitude to make teachers do extra stuff because obviously, they, if they do, those teachers should know that that's going to be above and beyond what's required. I, 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 don't, I can't speak for every campus. Um, I, I, I would imagine campuses have different crisis criteria that they put in place. They have different systems they put in place to make the school function. Sure. But if something is exceeding the workload of a person, then we would need to know as a system. But far as us pushing down, we're not asking teachers well, to take on. But, maybe but, I would encourage the reach out so we have the understanding because we hear, I hear from time to time people mm -hmm. saying, well, we have to do this, but my other friend at another school doesn't have to do this. And so you don't know where the requirement's coming from sure. or if it's a want, but maybe that's one of those things. Or at least the principals can say, if you work at my school, this is part of what I'm going to expect because we need it for X, Y, Z reason. And, 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 and I that's can the say, latitude. Yeah, and, and, and Mr. Jimenez and Mr. Jarrett, you were both principals. You know, I'm thinking back to the three campuses uh, that I ran. I had different requirements at those campuses based on a lot of things. So one of them was uh, behavioral was out of control. So I did implement some things because we were targeting behavior and I needed some things that to be done differently, i.e. the uh, way we fill out discipline referrals, the way we had them, 
um, things like forgot a pencil, um, you know, we had to adapt it. Then I used, and, and chime in with y'all, maybe I'm the outlier here, um, but then when it came to accountability, you know, maybe, holy cow, we, we did not do very well in X uh, grade level, and we're gonna have to do some different tracking because whatever we were doing wasn't working, so I did institute, but I, I don't think I institute, like I don't remember, but maybe I'm- I guess level. my real point, Gerald Bird. Some, some can, but I, I think this is the thing is, and what I would encourage us maybe is to, if, because I hear you all, that, you know, we're hearing these things, Maybe what we need to do is start picking some of these and bringing some teachers in, because this reminds me uh, of when we talked about with principals five years ago, uh, when I first became superintendent and I, and I was trying to abandon things, and I had them sit at CLC and we went through an exercise, and everything they listed to me were all law. Those were the things that were bogging them down, and there was like, you're not giving me something I can abandon, because that is the legal requirement. If there's something as a system we're doing that we're unaware of, or, or then yeah, I'll, and if we can do away with it, I'm all for it. Well, let's, I'd be let's get rid of it. Is that the principal says contracts are coming up again? If they're going to do something specific, and more importantly, teachers, counselors, admin, everyone, please work through your staff up here to let them know because once again, you may think it's a optional. I'm speaking now to teachers in the classroom and all the other all the other staff. When I say teachers and admin. We don't know what we don't know at the board level. We hear some stuff every now and then, but what is optional, what's not, because the constant <coughs> term is we're getting burned out. There's so much extra admin burden on top of what we think is required. So I encourage everybody to actually speak up and reach out because we're not gonna know what they are sitting here at the board level. Um, we can ask questions. This is a nice presentation. Thank you for clarifying. I do like the chart with the yellows and gray boxes as well, but um, that's what we need the input because it takes everybody to understand where we can reduce the pain points of the what's required what's not but with that yeah and I'd, I'd encourage them to talk to their principal and I to agree. the campus the site-based team because if if it's those types of things at a campus then those are venues i mean i had three or four different committees in which to bring uh concerns forward um and that's where we work through them as a campus and again if it's a district level thing you need to be reaching out to these ladies over here and, well. and telling them about it and making because they mr jared in fact he was meeting with them today he meets with them every monday to go through it, these are the things that we can take a look at because to your point, what you mentioned earlier, 504 was one of those pieces. It's like that's becoming a bear and it's how can we reduce it because it's every three years. But I, I just wanna remind everyone that, um, and Ms. Villarreal, you hate lawsuits, but some of this stuff, folks, it's there to, to protect us from getting into suits with 504 and LPACs and all of this stuff. So we always have to be careful and mindful that we're not removing a requirement that then causes a problem down the line. And we end up, because <coughs> I know that when I talked with the legal about reduc the reduction of 504, they push back because of the fear of more lawsuits. So there's always this balance that we're trying to reach about. Let's not overburden people, um, but let's also make sure that we're doing things so that we're not in the courthouse trying to defend something um, that's poor. But yeah, I mean, I, we're all ears. Yeah, I, I appreciate you you bringing this forward. I, I just just like you, Mr. Hilliard, um, to the teachers, it's encouraging. Let us know. We don't know what we don't know either. And the more information we have, we can do our best job to try to circumvent or just be honest with people. If there's a legal requirement, then we can say that. But if it's something that we can do differently, then we're all ears and willing to to be flexible to get there. It's just. Um, Sometimes there's different challenges that we take on and just like the campus principals, and that's what I say about the flexibility. One campus may have something they're putting in place and as he talked about campus principal, when I had seniors not going to graduate, I told all the senior teachers, yes, I needed a failure report myself, which was a sheet of paper signed off who is in jeopardy because they became on my watch list as their principal and I went every day to talk to those kids. So was that extra work? Probably, but it put me in a boat where I want to make sure they walk the stage. So the only thing I would like to add is if parents are coming to you, or I mean if teachers are coming to you, bring that to Dr. Micah. Because I do. Some teachers are worried about retribution, quite frankly. Well, Mrs. can you Gray. just say what the campus is uh, so that you can I don't talk to Dr. Micah. I, I know where some of the campuses are. And, um, well, I'm not asking you to say it out no, loud here, but, but I'm saying yes. because then he could look at it without knowing us. He could at least address the principal at the campus. Certainly, I can I can help do that because I hear it and it's not all in my SMD either. But yes, I can gladly do that because we just want people to be 
feel with the freedom to speak up as some are worried about speaking up because it is their job. Yeah, and I'm gonna, so we just finished our Hanover um, survey with staff. It's pretty interesting when it talks about do you feel comfortable in going to your supervisor with a concern? Um, those numbers were pretty high, if I recall. Like more than three-fourths of our teachers actually feel like they can come to a supervisor. And so, you know, that was positive. That was better than I, uh, I even anticipated it. So, um, again, it's, we want to work with them. And if there's things that we can do um, to help make their lives better, I'm all in. Okay, so is there any action that, because that was discussion and possible action. Is there any? That's how the item was asked. No, I know. To put so I'm asking you I don't think, around. as long as, you know, people are actually working towards a resolution and hopefully this is kind of, I guess you call it a living document where you can kind of make changes. That's, uh, that sounds like what you're already doing. Yeah, it, it was a great discovery document and putting it in one place just kind of helped us kind of see all the federal and state guidelines and it is a lot. And so we're just going to continue to see where we can uh, minimize some of that and, and try to make sure yeah. our teachers can and, do their job. And, and Ms. Villarreal, to, to, to that point, I, I, I like this document in the sense of when I'm sitting in Austin talking to legislators or I'm talking to legislators from the federal government, like these are the documents I'm going to show and say, look at, because they sit and they do something, that, oh, that's not a big deal, but look at all the other things that are already there. And the law has a great, and, the, and the, those that are making the law, I should say, are really good about putting things on. They're really poor about removing them. And so this would be that opportunity for me to, to really advocate on, on their behalf um, for some change at, at their level. Because I think some of this has to come from that piece and realize um, that they're contributing some of why teachers feel burned out is their requirements. And see, if you would take some of these ladies with you who actually experience the pain every single day, mm -hmm. because the one that I asked if you know there was anything that she would like to make um, go away, mm -hmm. obsolete, and she was, she, I love that look on her face. If, you know, I think it'd be very difficult for a legislator to deny that. So, so Ms. Villarreal, they do get invited when, when we're discussing certain things. So we do take people from staff to go up there as well. And sometimes, last year we took some principals up there to testify about some things as well. So we do take folks up there, but there's always that balance of we got to make sure that we're not giving them one more burden as well by taking them to Austin. It's like, yeah, dog chasing his tail. I got it. Well, I just, you know, I, it breaks my heart when I think about um, teachers being overloaded and they're so precious and I don't want them to, you know, leave this, you know, because where will we be without our teachers? And so if there's anything, I just want to see that there's something that we can do, if there is anything we can do to reduce that stress, that burden that they have because, um, when I first got into this, I was hearing horror stories where people were staying up till two and three o'clock in the morning and then going to work because they were still trying to catch, play catch up. I haven't heard as many anymore on that, so I'm really happy about that, but. Mr. Jimenez, do you mind, this isn't paperwork, but do you mind sharing the visit with some of the, the people you went out to campus and when they were talking about being overloaded and what you found, do you remember this discussion? <laughs> the one where you started asking them, what's overburdening you? And they said X, and you said, are we asking you to do that? Or is that something you've been asked to, that you're doing on your own? Now, do you remember? Well, I mean, and you, you pretty much said it. Um, I, I did want to go deeper into some of the questions about what was causing them stress and much of what was causing stress were things that um, legally we have to do. And um, so when we got through that part, that just became overwhelming. So then the other smaller things that they have to do seemed overtaxing because I spent so much time on these legal mandates that now my everyday things that I'm doing seems like a lot, but it's really this. If it were just what my everyday tasks are, maybe it didn't seem so overwhelming. So that was a lot of it. And, and, and again, understanding that some of these documents are hard and, and, and like uh, Ms. Kozar was saying, um, depends on how much experience they have with it. 
Some of it, if, if they're brand new, that may take longer. I know it took longer for me to understand certain things, and the more you do it, the better you get at it. But um, to her point, as a former principal sitting in arts, every situation is so different with kiddos that there's so much different types of information needed. And so it's not a one size fits all. It really depended on, on it. Our, our students with um, in adapted learning environments, those arts take quite some time because there's a lot of challenges that, that, that the kiddos may have. And so those are gonna take longer to prepare also. So. Okay, we good on that one? All right, item D, discussion and possible action regarding School Health Advisory Council SHAC membership. So we have a member whose status has changed, um, no longer a parent under that category, so we need to appoint someone new to- No, we don't. No, we don't. Uh, Ms. Corona, come on. Um, this has been attack, 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 attack. Um, that's actually. Could, could she finish what she was saying? I, I, I just, you know. Um, <laughs> could she finish what she was saying though? I, I, did, I, I wanted to hear what the whole Well, was. so we have bylaws and um, board policy that says you have to be a parent. When appointed. So but, the policy and the bylaws say that when the um, person is appointed to the shack, that they must be a parent. Um, otherwise, they would not be able to continue to serve at the next appointment. Um, so with the person in question, um, he has done a tremendous job in supporting our students and our community. And um, even so much so that Dr. Micah in one of the meetings pointed out what a great job he was doing and how beneficial he is to the district. Um, and I think jokingly offered him a job. Um, he is an important resource for our community. Um, it's very unfortunate that um, he had to make a difficult decision to take his kids out of the school, but it would be completely doing a disservice to our communities to break up his committee in the middle of a school year when they're doing such important work and to try to bring somebody in fresh and new who would have to catch up at this point. I have asked and I, I responded to your email when you said that I must rep replace him. And I advise that the policy does not indicate that during the school year there has to be a new appointment. The policy says that if a parent's status changes, then at the next term when we're no, appointing. No, that's not what it says. Well, then that means that your um, your committee member should be removed also, because apparently, from what I understand, um, your committee member has a conflict of interest um, because he is married to a district employee. He has no kids in our district. Uh, so that seems more conflicted than what she has. He's a community member. But you, the thing is, though, it was, it was per, uh, parents. And see, you're saying you're trying to take hers away uh, he can be a community member, but she but already had. To, but to remove somebody, first of all, it's an insult that this per because this person is willing to serve our district. Um, there were it, be, uh, circumstances beyond his control that he had to remove his children, um, but he's still willing to give that time, and he needs to serve his time. And I think we need to stop all of these attacks. It is getting absurd. And we need to just table this. We need to make it go away. He needs to finish, you know, his time. And everybody just needs to just bear with it. He's not going to be serving in that capacity next year. He needs to finish out his term. So you're saying we just need to ignore the bylaws that we worked really hard. Madam President, that's not true. They actually asked her strictly what Mr. Lopez said the, the way the bylaws are written. It's not a requirement for renewal. That is not a true statement you're making. Mrs. Aguilar asked Mr. Lopez, and he said it's not a requirement as written. We can address that, or the new board will, because some of us won't be here, and quite a few of us may not be here next year. The SHAC can bring a recommendation to us. It's still a recommendation, and we can address the specific mid-year thing, but as written right now, for appointments, it does not. All it says is that the member needs to be notified when their person no longer eligible. It does not require removal. And that was Mr. Lopez via Mrs. Aguilar response. So um, I, I think we it's one of those gray areas. I don't think we ever quite thought through that, but to do a shift and change here, um, 
We have the whole bylaws coming back, uh, I think, in May. They're supposed to do their annual. They're a year behind, but they're working through that. Um, and that'll be for the board to decide. To cause a disruption when they're this close to finishing all of the work that they've done, I think is doing a disservice to that committee, uh, to the entire district, quite frankly. And it's not a requirement. If it was a legal requirement, what that's if this what person had moved out of the district? Would you still be okay with them flying back into town? He to isn't, and that's, no, I'm, you're I'm just, asking, no, you're just but, making, but the you're person just, is willing finish, to continue serving. serving. Sure I, you can. I'm concerned about a precedent that we're setting. Oh, we're mm. going to let this person Mrs. be Hughie, okay. Mrs. we can update it. Else. The next board Why can not? update it in the bylaws and put a very specific caveat on there. Yeah. When you're done, we're terminating. We have two months left in this thing. He is not flying in out of town. But, that's but a, that's a what if. two months ago. And how do we answer to our community that's saying, why are you letting a private school parent determine what our public school children are doing? How do you answer to a community when you try to remove somebody he's, who's done he's such He's on the committee a, as the parent. Effective work. Yeah, I, I, I'm not denying any of that. I'm not denying any of that. So, so we're attacking a parent. To, parent. To, <laughs> how do you answer to a parent uh, and, yeah. and say that we're going to disrupt the progress of our students in the work that's been done because we don't like that the parents no longer are in the district. So let me ask you this. The um, BDF local says that um, for the standing committee, a parent legal guardian will chair each standing committee. So to me, that's violating BDF local because he's not a parent anymore. And Mr. Lopez had answered that question and advised that the um, the appointment is when that is the requirement. Midterm, there's no indication of in the middle of the school year to make a change. And and again, I I argue that this is for the benefit of our students, for the benefit of our schools. And this person has done a very good job and does not um, do anything that causes any harm to the district and is willing to still serve. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't meet the legal, the def the legal, sorry, yeah. the definition of parent it, in our policy. Right, for appointment, correct, you are correct. And so, I, I mean, there, there's, he has done great work, but there's also people that are willing to serve that would probably also do great work that have children in they the district that, possibly that they qualify that they, as parents. There is also parent. an ethical issue here too. Well, I, to me, you know, why do we have this section three that says change in member status? If the status of a member changes, the board of trustees will be notified by the facilitator of the change in status and the replacement will be appointed in accordance with BDF local. So why did we put that in here if we're not going to follow the process. Which we did uh, just a couple months ago for one of my, one of my people that had, there was a change in status. And they and stepped so away, but they also weren't willing to come and continue to serve because they couldn't show up. Different story here. It's gray language. We're spending time losing focus on what's best for the kids, what's best for the community. We can address this when they bring all the bylaws to us. It's gonna have to be addressed. We can clearly articulate that, but quite frankly, to disrupt what they're doing, just gonna set everything back. And we're really not serving the kids in the community, which is what we say we're here to do, in my opinion. So we can continue to do this, or we can just take a vote. I think I know how it's gonna turn out, but we can take a vote and just move on with it, because in my opinion, we're just gonna go back and forth. Um, and I don't think we're doing anything unethical to answer your question, Mrs. Huey, at all. I think we're trying to serve the community and the kids the best we can, and try and get this stuff finished. Did you want well, as far as I'm concerned, uh, Mr. Lopez has already said that this was not a problem. And there again, as Mr. Hilliard says, we can uh, bring it back when they, you know, in May, and we can discuss it and we can refine the language. However, we are so close to the end of the year, I think it's absolutely <laughs> ludicrous, especially with somebody who actually is willing to show up and is willing to do the work, and they're so close to getting the work done, than to remove this person and you know just install someone who's going to have to pedal as hard as he or she can in order to cat play catch up when we can just go ahead and we can refine the language you know in May after this board changes. 
But as far as I'm concerned, you know, once Mr. Lopez said it, I believe it. If you guys want to argue with him, that's great. I don't really care. But as far as I'm concerned, he said it. I'm good with it. Did he tell you that? No, I'm, you know, if they say it and you've already, you know, Mr. Hilliard. That, that, was, what was, that was what we shared through the communications that we've all received. If anybody had a question, they all could have gone Mr. Lopez if they disagreed with the assessment that was shared. Um, but I, uh, I have not spoken directly to Mr. Lopez, no, but I think we all got that same email with the information that was shared. And there was no, uh, he's saying, nope, you can't, so. Well, I'm just trying to adhere to our bylaws and policy. But. Are you implying that we're not? Madam President, because I take that as a personal offense now. And we I are, do too. I seriously, we're, 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 I am is, tired this, this of being is, attacked. This is the subtle stuff that has made this board not be as effective as it could be. It's unfortunate to see. Agree. This whole attack, attack, attack. Ever since I'm I got on this I'm not attacking. I'm just trying. No, this to. is this is an attack. This is another attack, and this is all we've seen. And this is why this board is so divided. And this is what these people see across, you know, the district. Because we, you know, this is not the first time that I've had to fight for a SHAC member. I had to for one of mine, and I finally had to say, you know, <laughs> no, that's not going to happen. So, you know, we just need to leave things as they stand. Um, you know, there's okay, going to item be item 12, new business for possible board action. Great. A board policy. One, possible action regarding board policy update FFA local. Mr. Jimenez. Thank you, President Grona and all. Uh, last month, the Board of Trustees approved the SHAC's recommendation regarding the fitness and physical activity subcommittees uh, update to the recess policy. Um, the updates have now been codified in FFA local. If you look on page nine of your packet or page three or four of the FFA local, you can see number eight in blue. That was added, and um, this is the um, verbiage that was shared to us um, by our subcommittee. And so now it's in there. Are there any questions about this? Do I have a motion to approve FFA local as presented? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item B, instruction of campus administration one, possible action regarding dual language and hyper accelerated math redesign. Someone signed up to speak. Sorry, that's number seven. <coughs> okay. Good evening. My name is Deanna Fentil and I have two children in the district. I just recently heard about the condensation of dual language and ham program. These programs are extremely important to me as a parent and is one of the reasons that I brought my kids to uh, NEISD. In my opinion, I don't feel these programs should be condensed. I'd like the district to reassess other programs if possible before making this decision. I'd like to know if other programs that were not considered were due to federal, um, tied to federal funding and if so, I'd like to know which programs they were. Um, I'd also like to know how condensing these programs affects um, the educators. Um, would they be under even more stress than they already are? Um, just thinking about what we just listened to, you know, with the paperwork that they have to fill out that kind of broke my heart because, um, you know, we're in the time of possible vouchers and the last thing I want to do is make our teachers want to leave or make them unhappy. So I know that paperwork is necessary, but um, we also have to consider that we have a lot of illegal mi migration here in San Antonio and the teachers are spread very thin. It doesn't just affect the, the migrant children, it affects our children. And I'm sure the teachers feel terrible that they can't teach the way they want to teach. Um, we want the district to shine and I feel like we need to try and do whatever we can to alleviate that paperwork. Anyway, where was I? We need to be ready to be compete and shine if the vouchers come. So I feel that the dual language and ham program will be essential in establishing quality education. Um, yeah, so I do, I do um, believe in fiduciary responsibility. I know that we are 
in the whole millions of dollars. I know we can't spend any more money, but um, if we could just assess and consider other ways to not spend any money, and I really, really don't wanna see the ham and uh, dual language program condensed. I think it, it would be harmful. Um, I'd also like to say that um, I'm in support of Steve Hilliard run, re, running for re-election. Um, you're, and you're asking a lot of tough questions tonight, Steve, and that's why I support you. And I believe that you're going to turn it out in this upcoming election, as will Raz and Gerwitz. And wishing everybody the best of luck. Thank you. Mr. Jarrett. Thank you, Madam President, member of the board, executive staff, and guests. I would like to ask Dr. April Muskies to come forward for this agenda item. Good evening, once again. Not to eclipse Colonel Lachance, but um, we are over the moon to be presenting and sharing the dual language and hyper-accelerated math redesign recommendations that represent our work over the past six months in gathering feedback and meeting with communities to listen to our stakeholders. This presentation is organized into two parts. The first will cover dual language updates and recommendations, and then we will pause for an opportunity for questions. Then we'll move into updates for the Hyper Accelerated Math, or HAM, program. These explorations were designed to seek possible solutions for staffing efficiencies, financial stewardship, and our commitment to, to delivering high quality programming with appropriately certified staff in our classrooms. Throughout this process, our commitment to a balanced district scorecard supported alignment across our four scorecard priorities, students, staff, stakeholders, and stewardship. Currently, our elementary enrollment in the dual language program is at 5,659 students across 16 elementary campuses as well as pre-K bilingual uh, dual language at the pre-K Academy at West Avenue. And so we see here, we have our current numbers and percentages of our emergent bilingual students. So currently our emergent bilingual students represent approximately 20% of our student population. In collaboration with our research and planning department, each dual language campus was prepared an efficiency report to analyze staffing, enrollment trends, and efficiency based on class size ratios of 22 students. 80% efficiency set the minimum efficiency rate. So what we see here is a district dual language efficiency report. Efficiency percentages for the combined general education classes are on the report to the left. Grade levels highlighted in yellow are below 80% efficiency. Enrollment trends over the past three years are observed below the grade level percentage efficiency rates. Enrollment trends um, over the past three years had a slight decline. So as we look towards the middle of the report, we see efficiency percentages for combined dual language classrooms across the district. As enrollment increased for general education, dual language, I'm sorry, decreased for general education, dual language enrollment has increased. What we see here on these next two slides are examples of campus efficiency reports. On this slide, we have Campus A, and this is a representation of a high efficiency campus, dual language campus. If we see here, both the general education and the dual language education classrooms are operating at 100% efficiency. This is an example of a low efficiency report, Campus B. If we see on the left-hand side, that is the general education classrooms highlighted in yellow, which are below 80% efficiency. And on the right are the dual language classrooms where we have four grade levels or three grade levels uh, highlighted in yellow. Can you just, for people watching at home, when you say efficiency, I don't think they understand it's student to teacher ratio. Exactly. Can you please explain what that number is so that the parents and teachers everybody watching understands when we're talking 80%, what are we talking and what's 100%? So. Yes, yes, of course. 
22 students in a classroom is the TEA recommendation, recommended classroom size. So if we had a classroom between 18 and 22 students, that would be considered operating at efficiency. 80% um, would mark that efficiency rate. So if you see if there's anything over 80%, um, it would not be higher than yellow as well. Any other questions on the efficiency ratings or reports or how they were taken out? This process provided an opportunity to meet with each campus community and staff individually and collect input through community meetings, surveys, and focus groups as well. Over the course of this exploration, there were over 37 opportunities to meet with stakeholders. So November 2023 through January, um, we had the survey window opened. Campus-led focus groups met February through March and we had four different points throughout the year that we met with principals to collaborate and gather feedback. The district-wide survey results demonstrated a preference to keep the dual language program as is. If we see option B is highlighted in green there, which is continue to serve both dual and traditional within the same campus and reduce the number of seats available for program applicants. These results were mirrored in each of the campus survey results as well. So not only did we hear that communities preferred to keep the program as is, but there was a strong desire to maintain the diversity at each of our dual language campuses. Once the survey window closed at the end of January, focus groups were created and led by campus administrators. Overall considerations, which are over here on this slide, were provided to the groups. It is important to note, number one, standalone dual sites were not included in the considerations based on the survey results from each of our communities. The availability of dual language seats for applicants and designated overflow sites are based on enrollment and they require no additional discussion from focus groups. Considerations three through six were specific to class sizes, and then seven was prompting additional suggestions which were encouraged. So what we see here is an example of the note-taking guide that each focus group did go through with a series of questions, analyzing their survey results, their efficiency reports, and um, adding additional suggestions and recommendations to ultimately have a recommendation. Um, that they could present to you. So uh, on these two slides, each of our dual language campuses did submit a recommendation and this is a consolidation of their responses. So what did we discover? We came to several discoveries, um, including some of our inefficiencies stemmed from our own staffing practices and took place over time in part from mobility and a decline in enrollment. We also discovered that our surveys have different needs and our communities care very deeply. Based on these conclusions, our recommendation is for there to be no changes in the dual language program and to move forward with developing a systematic allocation of staff at all of our elementary campuses. Due to mobility and shifts in enrollment, we recommend monitoring class size stability over a two to four week period and providing a trained long-term substitute while in this holding period. This scenario allows for the teacher to student ratio to be reduced one to 12 to one to 13 and minimizes premature disruptions to a student's classroom assignment. <coughs> Across each of our priorities of a balanced district scorecard, staff, students, stakeholders, and stewardship, there are possible benefits to this recommendation. At this time, I will pause and see if there are any questions we can answer. Well, so uh, my first question is on those focus groups, those recommendations about the 22-26, was that district recommending it to the parents to consider in the groups? Where did those ideas come from? Those were district okay, considerations. Okay, so that wasn't the that parent, because it makes it sound like the parents recommended that the way it's written. Just So I just want to right. make sure that's what I thought, that these are other options y'all were considering to do this. So I guess my next question would be is, 
this to me is not necessarily focused on improving educational outcomes. I think if you ask any parent that says, I want to put my class in a one to 22 narrow, one to 26 possibly, versus a one to 18, if I was a parent, I want, a, I want an 80, 85% efficiency. I don't want 100% efficiency as a parent. I, that's just me, that's what I would want, right? Because it's contact time. You're now also burdening the teachers. To me, this is really about the funding piece which I understand we do have a $39 million deficit, um, although our budget at she I have right here, we're actually doing better this year. We may not be as far, but my concern is the improved educational outcomes of the kids. Um, and this is a bigger discussion than just the dual language. I think this is the tip of the iceberg when we get into the allocations, but how are you gonna tell a parent who's in the class with one to 22, and then the other friend uh, is in the one to 26, but they have this up, so now it's one to 12. I mean, they're gonna say, the amount of individualized time on my child is just doubled basically in a class with two teachers, one to 26, right? Versus one to 22. Is that a pretty fair statement to say? Well, Reasonably I, fair? I, I just like to highlight that it would be just a holding period. So it, it is whether we could see whether that stability in the classroom does maintain that higher number. Um, going back to the mobility and the decline in enrollment, prematurely did, assigning staff so has caused some inefficiencies. Then would you hire a whole other teacher? Is that the plan? And would we be able to hire another dual language teacher? That would be the consideration after that holding so period. But do we have the ability to do so? Yeah. It's a consideration, but we have to be able to execute mm -hmm. yeah. so we can explain to our parents that, hey, we're over, we need to get another dual language. If we can't, now we're not providing yeah. service, right? Yeah, so let me let me kind of try to clarify that. Um, so what we were seeing, and it was mainly some of our campuses that had high mobility, which created the inefficiency. Mm -hmm. We had uh, many campuses that were operating at a very high efficiency level. So when they their student enrollment goes up, trigger of an additional teacher was not an issue because they're, they're, they were stable, they didn't leave. What was happening is a class size would jump up to 23 students. Mm -hmm. Then we go put a full-time teacher, of $80,000 teacher in the classroom, and then the next week three students leave. Now you've got two teachers for 12 kids each or nine kids at each class. So that's what created the inefficiency. So through this whole process, what we started looking at was the number. So when she says is a temporary hold, the temporary hold is allowing us to not place a teacher at a school that was actually taking the opportunity for teachers to be in a classroom that needed a teacher, which would eliminate some of the vacancies that we have because we're not knee-jerking and filling jobs so quickly. Okay, well I guess th th my bigger concern with this issue is that we're looking at this in a vacuum. We're looking at this in one piece. We haven't even started talking about middle school and high school allocations. We know there's gonna be cuts next year realistically in overall staffing and manual allocations. And so to try and make a decision like this, and if we say yes to one thing or another, well, what's the ripple effect that we may be setting ourselves up for as a board and as a district where we're not looking at overall the full picture of Manning? Are we looking at electives? Are we looking at all of the different language programs? How are we looking at this holistically as a board? Because we need to, we can't be making these decisions in vacuums. Um, I appreciate the idea and trying to get new approaches with the holding idea is, is good. But my concern is right now we're talking about all the savings in elementary, right? That's where the majority of the kids are and the majority of the staffing is. But we still have a fair amount of staffing at middle school and high school. And I know we've had previous conversations with Dr. Mike about Russian when there's only one or two students at a high school, but you still have to have the Russian teachers and maybe doing Zoom. But I think as a board, we deserve a full conversation on all of the outlook for allocation because this is much bigger than just the dual language. And we haven't got to the GT ham yet piece because that's burdening GT teachers, quite frankly, my personal opinion, but I, I, I'll see what else has comes of it. But I'm concerned because 100% efficiency does not equal 100% effectiveness. And at the end of the day, it's about maximizing kids' academic performance. And we need to focus on that. So we're gonna have to make some tough decisions. I'm not sure what that decision is, but I just have some significant concerns. I do appreciate all the work and the focus groups and really getting the parents and the admin involved because that's how it should be. I'm not sure what the answer is, but I think we deserve a full picture across all grade levels, and it can't just be at the expense of elementary, um, is what my concern is. We're gonna make decisions now, and it may not do that. So what other cuts are coming is what I really would like to know as far as or proposed ideas across middle school and high school, because that's gonna ripple through our entire manning plan, because teachers can get certified in multiple grades, right? I mean, generally it's K through uh, five and then middle school and high school, but right? They have the ability to shift, six. is that mm -hmm. correct? So. We, we need, we're making some tough decisions and next year is gonna be really tough for the people that are still sitting on this board because it's gonna probably be some positions going away. So we're already hearing about the family specialist concern and some other things from people. So 
I've got lots of concerns. I'm not comfortable making decisions on this without a fuller picture about middle school and high school and overall what we're doing for Manning. But uh, I appreciate the information and I'm glad we're having a conversation with the community, but I still have concerns about how it's gonna impact um, across the district. And with the emergent bilingual and getting enough qualified teachers, do we have enough qualified teachers now? Are you even close? Mr. Ailey, right now we average about 80 vacancies. Okay. So this system that we're bringing forward to the board was about listening to the community mm -hmm. and every stakeholder and saying we don't want a program change. And we, we have no problem and concerns there. But when we go through a discovery, what we realize is that if we create a system, and this is about systems change, if our staffing system is to immediately do something without taking consideration of the data, the historical mm -hmm. trends and different things like that, we're actually taking a teacher from another school and placing them to make this lower class size because the mobility rate is so high. This is not something that we're saying we're going to permanently put in place for a classroom teacher. This is something that is temporarily put in place where it's a ratio change where a teacher is sitting there with 22 kids. We're saying, okay, you're gonna have 22, but we're gonna put some help in there with you and support you instead of you out there on the island by yourself. And so the goal of it is, this is a temporary fix so we can monitor effectively to ensure that our dollars spent long term is not something that is continually turning over because we can't predict when kids are gonna come and go. But historical trends has shown us that some of our schools, the mobility rate is a roller coaster. And it is not the school's fault or the program's fault or the community's fault. And so we're trying to meet everybody's needs. And, and personally, I've enjoyed the journey in this because what thought was gonna work in one way through that discovery allowed us to say, we just need to slow down a little bit and we potentially could create a more efficient system and save dollars and put teacher, more teachers in classrooms. So that was the intent of this. It wasn't a program change. It is truly about an internal operations change. Okay, and then have we also considered how many central office staff teachers or PO central office who are teaching certified that could also help as interim fixes or going back or reallocating as we're looking at this so we can maximize the kids in the classroom and get the efficiency ratings there. I mean, we're looking at everything is on the board. We, we have. In fact, we, we started there, Mr. Hilliard. Um, we started there and started actually cutting central off and freezing positions to be more financial um, stable. Um, central office, we don't have like our social studies department right now. Secondary, we have two people that oversees the entire school district. So we started there so we can put them in classrooms, but that's a drop in the bucket consider, considering how much our needs are in the classroom. And so this attempt is to put people in there that are highly qualified, that can support them, give them the training so our teachers feel like they're not there by themselves, and create a system that allows these programs to still be in the schools. Okay, and this would be for both general education and all campus, all elementary yes, campuses, yes, the way yes, I read it, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. So that's the plan? That is. Um, okay. So the dual and, is actually more efficient yeah. than the monolingual classes. Yes. Okay. May, may I just say one thing, Mr. Hilliard? You, you, you made one statement I want to clarify. We are not financially better off than what we projected. In fact, I just sat with Dan and Susie the other day, and we are forecasting pretty much exactly what we thought we would be, $39 million deficit. Okay, because so, I'm so just looking I, at... I, I just want you to know, and something else I want to add, y'all, and you can go out and see it. Uh, you will listen. We, we heard Commissioner Morath speak. Um, when it comes to staffing, he believes our schools are overstaffed, 100% across the state. He will show you numbers of declining enrollment and how staffing is increasing. He, they are looking at efficiencies, and I am hearing this over and over again. What I, what I mean by that is, I don't anticipate a whole lot of money to come and save any of us. These are those things um, that are tough. You know, I, I think back to when um, my, ch my wife and I were married and we both ha were working. That was good times. And then one day, uh, we decided to have a baby. That was fine because my wife promised I was she was going to go back to work until she held that little baby in her hands and said there was no way I could make her do that. The next seven years were tough because we went from two incomes to one, and we made a lot of really tough decisions. The one thing about through all of this, though, we heard is, well, why are you starting there? Folks, I, look, we didn't start there. We started this five years ago right here, right here. I'll give you two examples right off the top of my head. When Bill Harrison became the executive director for transportation, did we replace that directorship? No. no. When Larry Fowler left, did we replace him? Mr. Villarreal, you just let a staff member go at the end of last year, correct? Yes, you let off several. We have been cutting here for years. We have always started because, and um, 
maybe Ms. Chancellor, you will remember, in 2019 when I became the superintendent, you two were sitting in the audience. You might remember this. I looked at the principals at the time and administrators in the, in the auditorium at Reagan, and I said, I will never ask you to do anything that I'm not willing to do to myself first. We have been cutting here religiously for five years. My thing is, is, and I'll recall, remind everyone, when we brought you a pay raise at the end of last year, I said, y'all, you can't afford it. We're going to have to make cuts, and they're all going to stink, all of them. And so when you say we haven't even talked about staffing at secondary because we're already making those cuts right now because financially that forecast shows that we're going to hit that number and we're going to be low. You all know up here that the state gave us no new money, zero, and isn't projected to do anything. And so while financially we can weather this storm and we're not like most districts around the state that are truly at a point where they're doing things like our neighbors to the south closing 15 schools. These things are real. Across the state, district after district is going through. There's a district right here locally that's projecting a $100 million deficit. These are real. So look, we don't have to do it, because you're the board and you can, you can do. But if we have any hope of trying to get somewhere to a pay raise for people who still are asking for it, we're going to have to make some tough decisions along the way. And, and it's going to stink. I agree. Because in this, chance, in this point, Mr. Hilliard, we didn't do away with the program. But, but coming up, um, just like there, there are going to be things we're going to have to stop doing. I understand. We can't I've, afford it. I, I absolutely understand. Can't. My question being is, though, I think we as a board deserve that full picture, the middle school and high school piece, because there is a totality impact in understanding what's going on. Uh, versus the piecemeal gives us a better holistic picture, in my opinion. Um, I understand, I agree, there's lots of tough coming. It's going to be uh, you know, positions because 85% of our budget is uh, staffing. Where, where do we stand with secondary? Is there a so, process in place yeah. already? So with secondary, we went to a staffing formula, and we scheduled face-to-face -face meetings with every single middle school and high school starting this week. We will sit down with each school, we'll go over their entire enrollment count, course selections that kids have um, chosen, and then their staffing allocations that is based on their, their enrollment trends. And so from there, we're just making sure we didn't miss anything as we made cuts, and then they have an opportunity to have an ask or even give a staff member back if they're overstaffed. But we're going through every single um, position um, pretty much with a fine tooth comb. Yeah, and Mr. Jarrett, who helped us design that staffing model? The uh, performance and planning. And right. budget office. And principal and, and principal. Yeah, we had a principal design team that correct. decided on the average class. We used size. the campus because what they stated was mm -hmm. about transparency. So they correct. helped us design it. Yep. You mentioned earlier about the um, mobility in some schools and not others. Is there a clear delineation or, or kind of concentration of where that's happening more than others? Yeah, I mean, we, we just saw, I mean, and I'm going to just use an example. Um, potentially, there was one school that was about $300,000 overstaffed. And it wasn't something that was overstaffed at the time, but over the mobility rate, they were losing people. And so they had three teachers in one grade level. If they dropped to two teachers, they were actually at about 20, I think they were still at 23 to 1. And then they were, and then eventually in some class, they dropped down to like nine kids per class. And so what we looked at was each individual, and that would be the process. It wouldn't be just a blanket statement and saying, oh, we're going to do this. We're trying to make data-informed decisions, so that way it's about systems change more so than program change. What do you see as a, I know, what type of cost benefit do we receive from doing this? Is this going to help us substantially towards that uh, shortfall that we have? Ms. Villarreal. We're $39 million deficit. I that is it. what we are going to actualize. Actually, we're, uh, what we're projecting right now is we're off by what? 300,000. 300,000. 300, I was going to say 270, but it's 300,000. So we saved 300,000 this year. So we're not quite 39 million, but we're darn close. What we are, what we, our plan is, is rather than come in with, um, 39 million in cuts, like I've seen some districts across the state do, what our plan was is to chip away at it. 
And so mm -hmm. this is just like secondary staffing is a phased in model over years to chip away so as not to just pull the rug underneath people. That's what this is as well. This is a chipping away at it. So what do we anticipate? Uh, Su is Susie sitting here? I know she showed me this. Uh, it's close. Yeah, I think that's the question. Yeah, it was, uh, Dan, what was, pardon me? Three million? No, 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 no. On for this dual language component to oh, it. Oh, for the, for we, the dual. We, we, we were like two million. Savings. Potential. Cor correct. And again, that does that get me to 39 million? No. It helps. But it but it's a piece of it, um, and it it's it's one it's a start to something we've already been doing. Again, we're trying to to cut and save and do whatever we can um, to try to save up some money because ultimately what we're trying to do, Mr. Villarreal, Susie, and I is in the end. What we still hear is teachers and employees want a pay raise. When you're 39 million, that's really tough to deliver that to those folks. And what Commissioner Morass spoke about was do you continue to have everything you've always had or do you keep those, keep fewer people but pay them more? And that's that piece that we continue to hear. You know, it, it, it's, it's like what I talked with principals last week. We talked about change, so I, I won't get into the nitty too, too deep, but. My dissertation was on school climate and change. And so we talked about change at a, at a really deep level. And here's what I can tell you. I don't care, uh, most people when they say, oh, I like change, that's not true. People don't like change. People like change when it's not them having to change. That's it. We don't like it. Uh, my wife hates it when I make a change. Um, it's just kind of the way it goes. These are tough. And, and unfortunately, without help from the state, it's going to get tougher. Because um, I, if I were a gambling man, I would have bet that the state was going to do something for us this last legislative session, and they gave us nothing. Zero. And so, um, and that forecast doesn't look great for next year. Not at least what I'm hearing initially from those um, that are tied to it. So with that, I, we can continue to look at our forecast and build models out with not anticipating anything new, which is how do we get there? You okay, Susie? I'm leaving. I'm sorry. <gasps> I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Sorry, Susie. Thanks for putting it out. <laughs> My apologies, Miss Lackhorn. Are we ready to move on to the hyper accelerated math portion at this time? Okay. So through an analysis of the HAM program, areas that we'd like to highlight is that there are benefits for an accelerated math program that we recognize. Uh, we understand that enrollment varies across our district and if a campus is assigned a roving teacher, their class sizes could range anywhere between one and 15 students. We also learned that there is frequent overlap of students in both gifted and talented GT program and hyper accelerated math. We discovered that there could be an opportunity to utilize second grade COGAT testing to identify students for HAM, as well as an opportunity to leverage the talents of GT teachers assigned to one campus to increased instructional time. <clears throat> Given the experience and instructional strategies both HAM Rovers and GT teachers utilize, there is potential for a partnership between the two. We would like to recommend a hyper-accelerated math pilot study over the course of three to four years aiming to increase HAM enrollment and increase full-time GT teachers at split campuses. Outlining the pilot study, Year one would begin with two to four campuses where full-time GT teachers will provide fifth grade HAM instruction and the development of a third grade pre-HAM curriculum and delivery. Year two would be focused on next steps based on the exploration of the pilot study and the implementation of the third grade pre-HAM enrichment. 
years three and four, we would expect to have an increase in hyper-accelerated hyper math enrollment, allowing for campuses to provide campus-based HAM instruction. Benefits in alignment with the district scorecard. For our key priorities, students would have earlier access to advanced math instruction and HAM enrollment. Staff, we would have an increase in GT teachers full-time at, at previously split campuses, reduced travel between campuses and professional learning opportunities. For our stakeholders, we would continue offering the HAM model at current campuses and there would be long-term benefits for increased efficiency and delivery of HAM and GT programs. Thank you for the opportunity to, to present these recommendations. I will open the floor again for any additional questions. Questions regarding here? So what is our current population in the um, participating in HAM and GT? A to total students participating in HAM fourth grade and fifth grade, I can get those numbers for you. And then GT as well. GT. I don't want to. I don't want to give you a number off the top of my head and be incorrect. So I will. I will get you our current GT. Do you have those, Mr. Jarrett? Okay. So we'll pull those. Mr. Jarrett will pull them for you. So I have a question. One of our earlier speakers tonight shocked me a little bit with his statistics um, and spoke about 35%. Um, success rate in high school for math testing was that right I I'm not I, I mr. Jared I mean I don't know those numbers off the top of my head I mean we shared this stuff with the board as far as the the, the tap our report yeah back in February yeah it, it would be in there and I don't I don't want to say that is correct I mean, it's 30 correct. something pages I thought it says 35 percent exceeds grade level oh meets or exceeds grade level so that yeah. means 65 percent does not uh, he meet. said exceeds i don't think he said even just meets i think he just said 35 percent exceeds grade level so i i, I don't i don't have specific i have the all school data right here but that not for all grade levels not the specific high school ones he was referring to so it, i guess my question is um as it pertains to ham and gt are these strategies to help us increase those success rates and how does that tie in together to ensure success of our students so and, and i'll answer that because one one of the things that really brought this forward was next year when we looked at ham enrollment some of our elementary schools have zero students who qualify and so if you have zero students that means there's a glass ceiling already being placed on these kids as far as their long-term academic performance and so our hope is to create a system that creates a pipeline of kids to gain greater access to more rigorous math opportunities, which then opens up opportunities if they want to go into engineering to access Calc BC, Calc AB, instead of stopping at the, the ceiling of Algebra 2. And it's not saying that that's a ceiling that's not appropriate for some students, but if we know we have high achieving students that didn't qualify for GT, it seems that we can put something in place to help stretch them a little bit so they can reach a higher standard for themselves. So just to clarify, right now the roving ham teachers are middle school teachers that come down to the elementary, so that that would go away. Yes. That that's part of the plan, right? Yes, sir. And the other piece is, so you said two to four campuses are proposed. Um, how are y'all going to identify which campuses that'll be, and have you talked to those GT teachers? Because I'm, uh, or have you talked to all the GT teachers in elementary? Because I think they probably have some strong opinions on this. Yeah. So so that's why as a, a pilot, so we called the ones that are split, mm -hmm. and we spoke to the roving teachers as well. Because one of the things that she talked about roving teachers is one to 12 or whatever the case is. Some, in some cases, there's a roving teacher and one student. Well, in order for a kid to engage in learning, sometimes you have to have peer-to-peer -peer interaction for that to be um, highly effective for a student. So that was the one thing. So we met with both of them. And, and you know, of course, you, you always got to monitor because sometimes people are going to tell you yes at that moment, but at the same time in the background, they're having a lot of anxiety, which is why we proposed two campuses. And so with those two campuses, it would be volunteer basis only. We're not telling people you're going to do it. But it's really for us to dip our toe in the water to say, is this the right plan? Because we won't know anything unless we try something. And so okay. that was what we were trying to do um, to try to get more, more students engaged. Okay, thank you.
for questions. And I, one last thing I just want to say. This model is not to permanently place a GT teacher to oversee HAM. The goal is if you increase your numbers and all of a sudden you have 20 students that qualify for HAM, you naturally trigger a teacher to teach full-time HAM. And then that gives the school a full-time GT teacher versus someone who's split between two different schools. That's, that's what this plan is designed for. Let me ask you, is this plan, of course, separate from the other one? So is there added on top of the other amount that we would be saving if yes. we approved it? Yes. That, so it's additional. Correct, that's one million with this. The only thing that I wanna add to this discussion, because we just talked uh, a, a great deal about paperwork and what's required and not required. Both of these programs are not required by the state, correct? These are not required. So these are add-ons that we've added. What we heard, though, very clearly is our community doesn't want to lose them, which is fine. So then and rather than just stopping them, how do we continue to do them but make them where they're a little more cost effective? And again, the, the great thing of it is, is we go down this road, and to your point, Mr. Hilliard, if some piece we're not seeing the academic outcomes that we want, well, then we're going to revisit it. We're not just going to keep going down there and saying, well, it's failing kids. Um, but we're also at a point where we have to do something different. And so, um, unfortunately, these are just those, those components to it. Any other questions or comments? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so do I have a motion to, um, for the recommendations resulting from the exploration of the dual language redesign and HAM programs as presented to make the changes and recommendations? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Opposed. Opposed. Is that two opposed? You voted for? Okay. Um, so the motion carries. Item two, possible action regarding Proclamation 2024 Career and Technical Education Instructional Materials Adoption. Mr. Jarrett. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to ask Dr. Mayos to come forward for these agenda items. Good evening tonight. We are going to go over the Career and Technical Education Proclamation for 2024. This is going to be presented by our very own CTE Assistant Director, Ms. Cheryl Parker. Good evening, Madam President, Board Members, Dr. Micah, Executive Staff, and Guests. It's my pleasure to be here today. I'm Cheryl Parker. I'm the Assistant Director of Career and Technology Education. I want to go over what we've been working on for several months. The State Board of Education issued a procl proclamation for a call for new instructional materials. And in that proclamation, it outlined procedures and policies and requirements that we needed to look at um, with regard to the textile essential uh, knowledge and skills for providing instructional resources for our students in our CTE programs. To that end, we went through a four-stage process. The first stage, uh, or phase, started in October and went through January, and it, it consisted of five uh, steps. We started the proclamation process by identifying which courses were under review. We got that guidance from the list of instructional materials that were prov provided to us through the uh, State Board of Education on the TEA website. From there, uh, once we identified the courses under review, we identified which committee members we wanted to evaluate those resources. Due to the nature of the career and technology education um, courses and the technical aspects of them, we did feel that it was I ideal for our teachers to be very much involved in the process. So we allowed all of our teachers who teach a CETE course under review to have a say in the evaluation of the materials, to be able to review them. Um, we really felt that their input was most valuable due to the nature of the um, technical aspects of their courses that they teach. From there, we held a, um, 
training on January 29th uh, via Teams. And in that training, we told the teachers on the committees what their roles and responsibilities would be in the proclamation and how the process would work. From there, um, we also contacted the publishers. The publishers that were identified were those that met our CTE criteria um, and the first and foremost met 100% of TEKS alignment. So that was very important to us. So um, we contacted those publishers um, via memo and asked them to present and provide digital and print samples for us. Uh, for the print copies that were sent to us, they were sent to the Remick building here. They were delivered to myself, and I sorted and repackaged those um, resources and distributed them to the campuses. Um, and then we also, and most importantly, probably the most important of the phase one process, was we were um, tasked with creating an evaluation tool. We talked a lot as a team to determine how we would use that evaluation tool, um, how it would impact teachers, um, and we wanted to make it as streamlined as possible, and we also wanted to have teacher input. So we identified a team of six teachers from various pathways within our, um, our CTE programs of study, and they got together and designed the evaluation rubric. Um, so we felt that it was very important if they were going to be evaluating the materials that they should have a say in what they're looking for in that process. So um, that concluded phase one. Uh, from there, we did, like I said, we evaluated, we got the print materials and the digital resources. The print materials were sent to the campuses, as I mentioned, and they were um, assigned to a campus contact, and that person was responsible for making sure that the materials were available to the teachers, and um, we also provided them the digital resources. I wanna make a point that not all the print materials um, Excuse me, not all the publishers provided print materials, but several of them were digital only. So where print materials were available, those were distributed. Our criteria was basically twofold. The most important factor that we were looking for in the publications were that they were 100% aligned with TEKS. Um, I did want to make a point that at one point during the process, I was reached out um, by the Cengage representative and told us that for the health science theory course, that they were looking to create 100% TEKS alignment, but they were not at that particular time. So I wanted to make that point clear. Um, and then we are also looking for digital compatibility um, with our network systems. So those were the two criteria. In phase two, which lasted from February through March, starting at the bottom of the slide, um, the committee evaluation window opened. Due to the nature and aspect of our career and technical education pathways, we have several teachers that teach anywhere from one to possibly four even more courses. So there are some courses where teachers may have had to evaluate several different publishers for several different courses. So we wanted to make the opportunity for them to have the time to evaluate those resources as long as possible. So we initially had a, de a deadline from February 1st through the 23rd. During that period, we also met with our LMS team, our digital resource team, to uh, create a Google form. So reaching out to the publishers to make sure that they, um, the digital compatibility factor was there. On February 27th, we held a publishers meeting via Zoom. In this meeting, we were, um, met the publishers as well as the teachers to ask any questions and for the publishers to give a final pitch. On March 7th, we opened the forum to the, our community over at the Community Learning Center in the evening from 5.30 to 7.30. We provided um, the print materials as well as digital access in that meeting. From March 1st to the 15th, uh, we contacted publishers for pr preliminary quotes. We extended the evaluation window for our committee members, again, because they had a large, uh, several of our teachers have a lot, a lot of things to review, we wanted to make sure that we had, um, they had adequate time. And then we also extended the community resource forum digitally for f those folks who could not attend on the March 7th um, meeting. Finally, we evaluated and tallied committee votes. Before we get into the data that we were able to collect, I wanted to give you a little bit of information on how we got there. The votes were collected via a Google form. In, um, on the form, there was an other option for teachers to write in um, information. Um, the other options were strictly to help us inform future resource decision-making for our teachers, but it did not 
uh, out, change the outcome of the proclamation um, titles. In cases where there is a 50-50 split, um, we were looking at pricing bundles, digital compatibility, uh, but most important was the fact that it was 100% TEKS aligned according to the State Board of Education guidelines. So going into the tallying the votes, I want to go through very quickly what the outcomes were. So if you bear with me, I'm going to pull that up here. Um, for technology applications grade six, the committee decided on learning.com. Can I ask you a question before yes, you start going through all of those? Yes, ma'am. I noticed that on the left-hand side it said how many committee members there were, mm -hmm. and the responses didn't. So, like, for instance, there were 13 committee members and only six responses. And then when you go to the next page, mm -hmm. the, so yes. I'm just curious why everybody didn't vote. Yes, thank you. Um, we provided, we created the evaluation rubric, and we provided it to every teacher who taught that subject. We provided ample time for them to evaluate the tools. Um, the teachers that eva completed the evaluation form and turned that into us and showed that they actually vetted the, the materials were allowed, were provided, excuse me, a ballot. So there were some folks that evaluated and got a ballot and did not vote, and then there were some that did not provide evaluation and forms at all. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. All right, so for child development, um, the uh, vote from the committee was for e-dynamic learning. Instructional practices was for, in this case, instructional practices, there was only one SBOE 100% TEKS aligned resource. So that's, in some cases, you will see that. For the principles of education and training, um, let me go one more. That particular slide, and there was a couple of, I think three uh, titles or courses where there was a 50-50 split. Um, our, recommenda our recommendation was for CEV Media in this case. Uh, Goodhart Wilcox does not meet um, our guidelines for, for rostering, and it, they will, we can roster with them, it's just not as seamless. Um, and so the other factor for principles of education and training, which is why we went with CEV as a recommendation, um, is they were, at that particular title is bundled with other educational and training programs. So it was a cost benefit as well as it met our guidelines. For anatomy and physiology, the uh, committee chose the um, McGraw-Hill publisher. I'd like to explain a little bit about the health science theory. Now the um, document, your book that you were provided, uh, my data is different from yours because we did find a discrepancy in one of the lists. So one of the teachers was left off the list for completing the evaluation. We identified that person. We wanted to make sure that all voices counted. So um, your data from the books is 33.3% for eDynamic Holdings. And after that person, that teacher, was able to evaluate the resources, they also voted for eDynamic. So it brought the percentage up to 50% from 33.3. Um, so it did not change the outcome of our recommendation. <coughs> Medical microbiology was um, a, another resource where only CEV media was listed. But as you can see, the teachers did provide us some input and some valuable insight there. Um, so we went with the, the recommendation for the publisher that met 100% of TEKS. Moving on to medical terminology, the teachers chose Cengage Learning. Pathophysiology was eDynamic Learning, excuse me, eDynamic Holdings. Food Science was also a 50-50 split. Uh, this is another case in which CEV bundled this particular course with another um, with other titles, so we would have been buying this one anyway, and CEV met our requirements as well as the digital compatibility. Forensic science teachers chose Savas Learning. All of the computer science teachers, both uh, computer science one, computer science two, as well as our fundamentals of com computer science, which we at NEISD call principles of computer science, they all went with the um, Code HS publisher. The cybersecurity capstone is another example in which the, um, the only SBOE 100% uh, um, TEKS aligned resource is eDynamic Holdings. However, we did get some feedback from that teacher as well. Foundations of cybersecurity. 
was uh, CEV Media, Engineering Design and Presentation 1 was Goodhart Wilcox, and we only have a few more. And Engineering Design and Presentation 2 was CEV Media and Principles of Applied Engineering um, chose Goodhart Wilcox. I want to make the point that Goodhart Wilcox was one of the um, publishers. They can roster our students, but it's not as seamless. So in two cases, um, in two courses, the teachers and committees votes overrode the digital compatibility because we felt the 100% alignment of TEKS provided that high quality of instructional material factor, which is what we were really looking for. Um, and so that's what guided that decision. So here are the summary of the recommendations based on the data and the pie charts that you guys just um, viewed. With all of these resources, we have chosen to go with a four-year digital access, and in cases where a print, print copy was available, we, were, uh, we are requesting a class set for those particular um, courses. We went with a four-year uh, title, or four-year um, package deal, excuse me, because the nature of our courses, many of our courses are aligned with industry-based certifications, which base change frequently, and we wanted to have that flexibility to be able to align ourselves with current industry standards for those particular titles. <coughs> Phase three, we are in currently. Um, we just extended our voting window. We valid tallied the votes. We've evaluated all the quotes, prepared this presentation, and are now awaiting board approval. Our final phase four is our implementation phase. Uh, once we get approval, then we would be placing the order. We'll be coordinating with our NEISD warehouse, coordinating with the LMS department to make sure we have that compatibility um, factor, and making sure we're rostering and making sure it's seamless for our students. We'll be planning and conducting professional development over the summer and making sure that these new resources align with curriculum, um, the curriculum resources and the teachers are prepared for the beginning of the school year next year. This concludes our final steps, which are this board presentation, the requisition process, and impl the implementation plan. Thank you for your time. Are there any questions? Yes. Okay, I'm, I'm really disappointed in this process because you know we're supposed to you know, step out on a limb here, and according to, um, I believe it's HB 1605, if we make a bad decision on this, we're stuck with it. We can't go backwards. We, I've been unable to look at anything. I went in, I tried to get into, you know, just look at something. I don't know, it may have been user error, whatever, but it denied me access to anything. I, have, I don't feel comfortable voting on this right now because we have, you know, I, in my world, if, if I'm gonna put, you know, if I'm gonna own this, you know, 1,700,000 and something thousand dollars, I wanna at least get my eyes on this. And I feel like we should have been given the opportunity to look at this a couple of months ago. And, you know, I may not know what I'm looking at, but I know what I'm, if there's some stuff in there that doesn't look right, at least I could ask Mr. Jarrett and say, hey, is this okay? So um, in my world, I don't feel comfortable with any of this. I appreciate that question. All of the access materials were on the STEA website um, with um, direct links to access the materials. I tried. Um, I, matter of fact, today I was, matter, poor Mr. Jarrett, he got a double load of it. When so he so I me. think I discovered, you, you were on a, um, acceleration learning um, site and so that's not the the resources that we were looking at I don't know how it took you there because I tried to get to that link is what I believe it, it was the link and see here's the yeah. thing you guys had the link buried and I'm just saying it's not as um, I'm not trying to be harsh or anything like that but keep things as simple as possible because I first of all the link was buried within the paperwork yeah. and I you know kept thinking I know there's a link somewhere and then I spent all that time trying to find the link, and then I realized, wait a minute, when I back, went back on my paperwork, it was buried in the paperwork. It should never have been buried in the paperwork. That's number one. Number two, I used that link, because there were actually three, I believe, three different ones that said, go to this. 
If those links were not designed for us, they should not have been included in the paperwork. Because when I went back in and I tried to get, you know, that it just denied me access, which by this time, it's the day we're supposed to be voting. And I haven't had a chance to look at anything. So of course, I'm not happy about it. You, you poor baby, you heard about that one. So um, what I'm saying is, I would, you know, in my world, I want to see this stuff before I say or put in, you know, that it's recorded that I voted yes, because I have not seen it at all. I haven't seen a page of it. And my that brings me to another question. These people that looked at this material, mm -hmm. did they actually see everything, the whole entire, all the textbooks and everything, yes, every single page was? They, they get everything sent to them, which is why the process, as you're saying, two months ago, this, this book that is given to you, as complex as it is, is a story. Is a story that tells you the beginning of the book to the end of the story. And the reason that was put in place many moons ago is that as Board of Trustees, you guys have many moving parts that you're constantly trying to navigate. And so you put committees together to vet materials and resources and try to make sure that it aligns to the standards and the TEKS and make sure that kids are going to be taught, which is why we kind of remove ourselves from that process and give the ownership to the classroom teachers because they're the ones that are more intimate with the resources as well as the instructional practices. So this, this book that was given to you, as complex as it is, it was really to try to tell you, here's our story to ensure that let you know that a lot of people have put eyes on it and we've given as much transparency and communication as we possibly could. And I respect that. Yeah. I do. I respect that. However, I want to put my eyes on it too. And that, and I would have appreciated having links. So like I said, and I told you this afternoon, I don't feel comfortable with this. Even if I had just been able to spend like three days with the material and look at it and see what it is that I'm voting on and I'm saying yes to. So is there any way that we can um, set this aside, you know, and, you know, just so that we have as a board, have you guys looked at any of the material? No, I trust the people that work with it every day to make the recommendation to us to, to do this. And I, I get what you're saying, but if, if you're saying, I don't, I might not even know what I'm looking at, then how would we know what questions to ask if we don't even know what we're looking at? And so, uh, you know, I, I don't know that, I mean, I have some questions, but I don't know that us going through the detail on this is gonna bring out anything other than, hey, the classroom teachers have looked at it, the district staff have looked at it, and they're the professionals that do this every day. So like in my job, somebody hires me to provide them input and, and uh, recommendations on what is best for them and their and their money. Um, I, I look at that here, same same kind of thing, is that I'm getting a recommendation and suggestion from the people that do this every day um, to to move forward with some new curriculum. I am curious about the house bill you mentioned. What what is that that we would get locked into? I don't. Apparently, I don't there is that. a. I was informed about this today. It's HB 1605, and this is what set me back. Um, was that if we make a bad choice, you can't undo it. It's like it, uh, it makes it impossible to get rid of bad cool. curriculum. Cool. So yes. if there's something buried in this book, yeah. we just spent, you know, one million seven hundred and something thousand dollars on stuff we can't get rid of. Right. And, and you're right. I mean, and that's part of why when they, the state releases IMA funds, it is that you're in a proclamation year and you buy these resources and essentially you're married to that resources over time, which is why we don't do it as an, um, an isolated person making one informed decision. This adoption just for CTE is 19 um, subject areas that have to be covered. And so to do that, we had to get people that are teaching the engineering class, people that are teaching anatomy and physiology, because we want to make sure that they're going through it more thoroughly because they're the ones that's going to deliver it. And the reason that that's important for me to mention is, as you're wanting to review, and I, I totally respect and I, I commend you, actually, because a lot of people say this, this will put me to sleep if I review all of this, but really our goal as a board is to try to say, we're going to do everything we possibly can to protect our children and our district by bringing to you the best recommendation based on the information that we have presented to us. Mr. Jarrett, correct me if I'm wrong, but 
the materials that our teachers reviewed were first approved by SBOE, correct? correct? We have to wait for that. So they are first vetted, like we're not getting wide open to go out and pluck whatever. We, so we the state is saying like, hey, we're approving these materials. Now from these, make your choice, you correct? correct? Yeah. Okay. And you can write in, but ultimately we go by the list and then we meet with the vendors. And say that again. You can write in. You can in. write in. Right. To so try you, to can, find you can abandon resources, it. but right. we use the state approved list. Okay. And just to clarify, state SBU does the TEKS, but it doesn't do legal compliance, correct? What they recommend is TEKS 100% compliant, but they don't do legal compliance with the law and all correct. the changes, correct? correct? Yep. Okay. Because in my line of work, as Mr. Byers talking about, we talk about not accepting unnecessary risk and accepting at the right level. And at the end of the day, it's this board of trustees that is accepting the risk. And if we get bad curriculum and someone decides to sue us and we put this district at risk because we look at the legal compliance piece, is my concern. Am I an expert on some of the CT stuff? Absolutely not. Should I have had two or three weeks to just peruse through it? Yeah, my general questions, like Mr. Meyer, I'm not going to say no, but we have not had the time. And it's disrespectful, quite frankly. That is one of our core roles as trustees, by law, is curriculum adoption. It's a big deal. I have to be able to explain to any of my community members, anybody saying yes, yes, the experts in the classroom totally understand that, I get that piece. But we have to, we have that authority, and quite frankly, it's subverting it by not providing me seeing this. This is the first time I saw this. I got the slides a couple of days ago, first time I saw this. The other book we got, we got at last meeting, was canceled because that. The bigger concern I have, we'll get to the science, is how we communicate to the community. I heard 7 June or 7 March there was a meeting with the community, mm -hmm. but how was that communicated out to all the parents and everybody else to come up? How mm -hmm. do we spread that word? That's it was on the uh, the website, NAISD website under the calendar. Okay, so mm -hmm. are we proactively pushing information because we need to, this is the part where we want the parents, because that way if we have the community and mm -hmm. parents on the front side, there, it cuts the possibility of going, well, we didn't know and we can't, you, they, it reduces the ability for them to complain or say we did not we, we made it very clear. Post it on the website. I don't know how many people check the NEISD website. I rely on the superintendent email and the principal emails right. as a parent. Right. So that's another piece of the process that I think we need to rethink mm -hmm. when we're doing these major curriculum adoptions, especially the science one, which we'll get to, but I have concern with the process. The material itself, I don't know, but I've never seen it. But now I'm, I'm taking authority for this. And actually we're putting the next board on it because two of us aren't gonna be here and four of us may not be here in a month. That's, that's that's my concern. Is, is, that is this the same, this looks to me like it's the same document that was emailed to us on April 1st. Okay, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, we've had this for a week. Yes. And but it's not two and or three. But and it's, it's that week, but once again, this doesn't show, I didn't see but a single. This, but but uh, this book is what was emailed to I us. Under, I so. understand that, but my point being is I, there's nothing. It, it just printed this out, right. but there's nothing in here that shows me a single thing about that. It tells me the process, and I do appreciate that, and it's important that we understand the process, but it doesn't show a single even example of some stuff. And once again, it's 19 subjects with CTE. The science one's a different one. It's the process and understanding that piece that we should have the ability to flip through and look at the links. Yes, once again, we need to talk about this. This is all about continuous process improvement. Understand the adoption piece, the TEKS piece, but there's also a legal compliance piece. And trying to adopt $1.7 million, um, you know, we're committing this district and the board for the next four years to answer for that. Um, just have concern with the process, uh, not necessarily the material itself, but also the community involvement piece. I think we need to do a much better job communicating so that they have a chance to see it on the front end, not do a calendar invite to see personal opinion. Dr. Well, Michael, can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. um, can you, you were talking, so we, 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 the board, do not approve curriculum, though. Is that correct? We're approving the instructional materials, but the curriculum, like you said, comes from the State Board of Education and TEA, but we don't do the curriculum itself. This, well. I, I was asking Dr. Michael if you could kind of expand on that a little bit. Well, I'm, I'm not sure that's exactly what I said. The, what I said is SBOE took a look at these materials and they said to us, these meet the TEKS requirements. So the TEKS are the curriculum that we are to teach. Exactly. Okay. Correct, Mr. Jarrett. Do you have anything so, to add on to that? Yes. That and so then the TEKS are broken down into what our instructional planning guide, which then guides the instructional practices. Right. But I, so, so the materials themselves 
is really what you're, you're, you're voting on, is the material. Not necessarily, but it's how we're going to teach those TEKS and the materials we're going to utilize or our teachers are going to utilize in order to, to get to those mandated, the mandated curriculum by the state. So basically we couldn't really like go out on the open market and find some whatever that we like maybe better. Well, but whatever. that's what Mr. Jarrett said. You actually can do that, but, but, but we don't. We, we don't. We don't go out and start digging around and trying to find other stuff um, just because, to Mr. Hilliard's point, that is where you start to open yourself up to uh, some, some components to it. Um, when the SBOE is saying, look, this meets the requirements, you're, you're somewhat sheltered there because you can say, well, the State Board of Education just gave me this book. Exactly. So this is what I'm going by because they're, they're, they're blessing it. They're clearing it with the cheeks. Okay, not legally though. And then um, I, I think I would kind of agree with Mr. Byer that these are the professionals, these are the people that are where the rubber meets the road. And if we can't have trust in them, then then what what are we doing? I would, Mr. Hill, you're back to your point. If you were the pilot on my plane, um, I would not go up in the cockpit and tell you how to fly because I'm going to assume that you know what you're doing. Mr. Byer, if you're doing work from our business, Ms. Villarreal, if you're leveling the foundation of my home, I'm going to trust your word that you know what you're doing. And so I, I truly do trust these people implicitly. I'm extremely impressed with the work that's gone into bringing all this to us today. And I really appreciate the time of all the teachers that, that, that gave us all of this information too. So thank you for all that. I know you already have a lot on your plate. And you added this to it, so thank you for that. Yeah, well, see, I'd offer the counter is the process is that the concern being expressed. We know the teachers do a great job. We appreciate that. We're expending one point seven million dollars for this one and about four and a half for the other one. The process and us having access to it, the authority that we have, is the discussion point. Uh, that is what I think we're trying to highlight here. It's not saying that we don't appreciate all the work and we don't. We're not disrespecting any teacher for their technical expertise, especially in the CTE area because of those skill sets. So I don't want to mix the orange there. This process is we, as a board, need to have access to all of the instructional material. We are the ones adopting it. We take the legal responsibility if there's a problem with it. Once again, SBOE says it meets the TEKS. They haven't taken the legal compliance requirement piece. Remember, this process has been going on, and some of the laws have changed since they started this process in SBOE on this curriculum. And there's five different publishers. Who's guaranteeing? One of them is a European publisher. Uh, they're supposed to meet all of our requirements. TEKS-wise, they do, but are they, have they met all the legal stuff? I don't know, and we don't have time to even look at it because it's such a short time return. I'm worried about legal compliance pieces yeah, Mr. for future I just, boards. I want to just make sure I get process correctly. Your, your concern is board having access to the instructional materials earlier, so when the committees are reviewing it, would you guys prefer to have it then? I'm just trying I, to make sure. No, I, I think we have an idea of what they're reviewing, yes, because obviously they look, the middle of the science one coming up, there was like a four-way split on one. It was evenly split. So we have an idea. The important piece that I think is really missing is directing the community to be aware of this and giving them time on the front end to look at this stuff. We have a lot of very smart, well-educated people who are experts as well in all of these subject areas, especially in all the science areas. I have a neighbor who has a PhD in biomedical sciences and stuff. would probably be interested in some of this stuff. So we need to let the community and the parents have a say and look at it because then they know about it. This is all about transparency and the process clearly articulating, hey, we're science. Do people realize this is a four-year and probably realistically an eight- or ten-year thing? Most people don't understand. The average parent doesn't understand the SBOE process and the timelines on these, what this means. Yeah. And I'm just trying to get it down. Yeah, so that's, in my it, opinion, we sure. need the, the, not only the board, but also the, I really want the communication to push it out to the parents so they have time to meaningfully review. They need a couple of weeks. You can't go through thousands of pages. I mean, the science, there was what, 14, 15 different things recommended to us? Books, yeah. I mean, it's a ton. So part of the process though, is the publishers are the ones that have to go over the materials. So that's one of the things is also for somebody to explain what they're reading and looking at. So, I mean, that's some things we gotta work I, through, I, but if you're just looking at it without context, that's why we did it where it's more the publisher and the community coming in. Well, how so about we let's not make assumptions and let's just let us have access to something that we're about to vote on? Is that too difficult to ask? No, no. What we're asking for, it's very simple. 
Right. Let us see the product. So, okay. so Mr. Hilliard, I just right. text legal counsel to ask, does the SBOE make sure yeah. that materials meet our state law? Yes, they must select materials in accordance with state law. Or, so, so that is the legal counsel for the district okay. who is confirming that the SBOE cannot choose material that do not comply with state law. In, even the most recent past law, because this, this that, price timeline looked like it started a year ago. Yes, they must select materials in accordance with state law. Okay. That's, ex I mean, I've okay. read to you exactly the text message okay. to them. Thank you. Um, is, is because I'm asking to your point because I honestly did not know the answer. And, and again, look, um, we can always improve processes. And mm -hmm. we've, we've continued to try to do this um, throughout. Uh, all we can do is take the feedback this evening and use that yep. uh, moving forward to, to, to make some changes to it. But it, with some of this stuff, it's, um, they're difficult with timing to make happen because you and I visited about this today. And, um, you know, to your point, Ms. Villarreal, look, I guess, you know, we make these things digital because most of their textbooks are going away. But what we may have to do is start looking at, can we get m print material to some extent and give you the option of getting print or, or that so that we don't have the technological <coughs> issues that can come with uh, accessing links and, and things like that. Dr. Mike, can I, can I speak to that point? Um, some of the publishers don't even have a print copy. Um, and then all of the, all of the digital access uh, was online, but I, you know, take note that in the future, we can make that available and make that more obvious to where you could find it, so. Well, it's just, it'd be very simple, and it's, mm -hmm. and I'm not, what I'm, I don't mean to be abrasive about this, but if I wanna look at something, mm -hmm. I have the right to look at it. Absolutely. And it feels it's, like um, I'm being sheltered, you know, away from information that I want, and I don't like being sheltered away from information that I want. And let me rest, Pachutis, I there was no intent to in any way hide that all of that is on the TEA website. So we can make that more obvious to where you could find it. But it is all public. And, and but in the terms of the book and giving that to you sooner um, and a little bit more obvious, we can do that. Can I see this is what happened when I went on the TEA website and I was trying to get in to look at books. You know, and that I think that the science team yeah. might be able to speak to that resource and it would just and i was access denied mm -hmm. and of course that didn't make me happy and then poor mr jarrett had to hear about it okay. i'm still feeling bad about that one but no, you understand. know the thing is i don't i if i want to look at something mm -hmm. i want to look at something i may not necessarily it may not be my no. bailiwick but by golly by gosh that is book i want to look at yes ma'am okay so i'll, I'll just sorry to interrupt but i mean i'm gonna say to mr jared got finished and then we can move on mr Grotto. yes the process i think should be as soon as the staff has looked at it narrowed mm -hmm. it down the community should have a couple week window to access it, it digitally at campus or whatever in the board and it should be sent to us so it's pretty easy we're we're busy and cover lots of ground and not burying them just say here's the access it'll be open for this two-week window three window we're not all going to look at it especially when you look, talk at the science with that but that's why the community piece is important let people who are engaged involved look at it so they have an idea are they going to do it the teachers are going to be the primary resource based on what's that stuff but we're talking about that transparency and inviting everybody in and clearly communicating to them pushing the information so that's easy for them to know it's coming even on time tight timelines and build that in is a recommendation for the process to answer your question uh, i'm done mr girl that's what you want to finish answering mr jared's question and, and even even if it's even if it is one meeting just make sure we're advertising that meeting yeah. maybe better than we have um and because I, I can understand there's some value having the publisher there to be able to actually answer the questions that, that people might have and, and engage in somebody that might know microbiology. I had two questions, yes, um, and I may have missed it because I was looking for something during the presentation, but yes, sir. Uh, the Cen Cengage, is that how you pronounce it? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. So they were not 100% teaks on one subject. On health science health theory. Science. Yes, sir. But then we had a recommendation for them on for the medical terminology, so I assume that they were because 100 they, aligned. Yes, sir, exactly. Yes, not all publishers were 100% teaks for every title, for every course. Okay, uh, mm -hmm. and then the other question I had, so $1.7 million for these mm -hmm. 
19 various, courses. Yes. Um, how does that compare to what we had budgeted or allocated for the year for these materials? Do we have that number? That I Are can't we speak to. On target, <laughs> under, over? So for instructional materials allotment, we get um, funding every two years. And essentially what we have to do is we have to build a savings account whenever we do have any kind of adoptions that are coming forth. So we had to deal with a large gap year approach where there were some instructional materials that were delayed due to COVID. Mm -hmm. And so there were, there were all of those planning processes that we had to put into place. So we had to be very fiscally responsive with the amount of subjects we were going to be passing forward, one with K-12 science and then with the 19 uh, subject areas that we're looking at through CTE. Okay. Um, so we're working whatever numbers we can to stay. As, <laughs> to as, as yes, as responsibly as possible, okay. yes. All right. Do I have a motion to approve the 2024 proclamation instructional material purchases and adoption <laughs> for CTE courses as presented? of the 2024 district level instructional materials committee and certify that all students will be provided with instructional materials that cover 100% of the Texas essential knowledge and skills. So moved. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. 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 Was that all three opposed? Okay. That motion does not carry. All right, so what does that mean then, Dr. Micah, for our staff, for our district, that we don't have instructional materials now for our students? So basically that delay would um, potentially prevent any type of staff development for it because every other district across the state is also adopting instructional materials and they can only push out a certain time. It's not for certain, just depends on if the board reviews it and feels like it's an appropriate um, adoption if in a you know timely manner then it will have instructional materials otherwise they will be using materials from this current year what, what uh, when's our next meeting that we could how first of all how long would people need to feel comfortable to review the um, material that we've got presented in front of us and then how does that relate to whenever we have the next board meeting so we could put this back on the agenda and talk about it and that's my colleagues on the board up here well, I, I don't think it's part of the agenda item, but um, we need to get the community involved, uh, especially in the science area. The CTE is very specific, but I still think we open it up. We need to do a better job. We Could we do it in two weeks? Possibly. Um, quite frankly, I think it should wait till the new board needs to accept ownership of this, in my opinion, because we're spending a bunch of money in a fiscally um, tight time, but um, the minimum would be two weeks, possibly. But this is a process in a timeline, because once again, we not planned it well, in my opinion. But that's not really the agenda item. So we have a board meeting in two weeks. And then um, we have a May 13th board meeting. So um, we can have access, give the board members access to the materials. Would you like it in a different way? Just tell us exactly what you need and we can get you whatever you need. Just give me the links. Okay. Get me something that works so that I can see what I'm looking at. Just list the subject in the link that would access to it, whether it's, you know, any of those particular, especially for the CT, but break them down and make it that kind of like this sheet here and then, as well. And then do you need to, or are you expecting them then to also like put it on the website so that community can go look at the links also? I'm, I'm trying to follow the process you're expecting here. Well, you know, what, it's my under, asking of them. It's so my understanding that this uh, particular, um, you know, when it was open to the public, you can correct me if I'm wrong, and that's perfectly fine. But it was done over spring break. Is that right, Lamar? I was sick on science. Okay. Uh, I, I, yes, Mrs. Yu, I believe it should be available uh, to the community to access the science as well as the CTE um, within the confines of the publishers and the publishers are being that bad. I mean, we should be able to have a very strong representative sample if not access to everything. Um, if they want the business and millions of dollars, they should be able to provide that. Obviously it's copyright protected and that's the caveat, do it on campuses. I think it's appropriate and reasonable because I know some stuff can't be done offline or keep it in sky or whatever the technical piece is to make sure we don't violate copyrights. But yes, it should be available to all parents and community members. 
uh, and in some reasonable manner um, over the next two weeks minimum is my opinion. So, so do you want us to host these at campuses? No, I didn't know if they needed to be on campus for some of the hard books, if there's hard, because I know some of these are hard books for science, if there's for just to protect the material so it doesn't go. Right. No, no, I, I just want to make sure no, that, that the ask was, because, uh, again, I, I'm just trying to be crystal clear, so. Digital access is great, Dr. Mike. If they can do it from home via Skyward or whatever is an okay. appropriate resource is great. In my personal opinion, I don't know what the rest of the trustees think, but make it as easy as possible so people access based on their schedules. So a lot of the ballots had very, very low participation. And I know that you had mentioned that that was if the teachers had filled out the um, rubric on yes, the analysis of mm -hmm. the subject. Mm -hmm. I think for me, with all these other variables, the timeliness of being notified, we, didn't, we had no idea that there was a public open session for review of the materials, and then these, these numbers are so small, it, it really makes me uncomfortable with the whole process, and it's a lot to, it's a lot to approve. Um, do those teachers that did not complete the rubric, do they have time to continue to submit anything? Would that significantly change? We've got the engineering design and presentation to two responses. Uh, foundations of cybersecurity to respond. Well, some of those, well, some of those some are only taught by one or two now. people, yes. So, it's, it's, so I mean, you'll see. Um, there's like one that has a 13 yes. that had like six responses. Exactly. So, so I mean, for example, food science only has two. Um, foundation of cybersecurity only has two teachers. Um, very the pathophysiology only has four, but I agree with you. There were some that didn't, I mean, they didn't have full. I think the bigger question is if they, yeah. could they still submit if they didn't have a chance previously, if they finished the rubrics, could they still submit because of the small sample size when you're only talking three or four teachers? Yes. And when I identified that we were coming down to the deadline because I okay. opened up from February 1st to the 23rd, I reached out to the teachers. I reached out to Dr. Munoz and I said, I'm concerned that I'm not seeing some mm -hmm. of these rubrics coming in. And we put out a call um, to, you know, pull in some more teachers. Um, we did get a better, you know, feedback um, after that email was sent. And then we also extended it uh, to three days after spring break. So the teachers had, um, they didn't have to use their spring break time, but they had through spring break an additional three working days after spring break to submit evaluation forms as well. So we did try, um, I did try in every way to make sure that we were getting the feedback from the teachers because we know how valuable that was. And then in terms of um, the public knowledge, we did have the, um, we didn't have a large turnout for the in-person session, um, but we also, because we didn't have a good turnout for that, we also posted, I reached out to the community, um, I'm sorry, the communications department, and it was posted on social media platforms through our communications team, and they were provided all of the digital access codes um, didn't get a lot of feedback there from the public at all, I'll be honest with you, Sarah. So, but we did make every attempt to reach out to the community and make them available, uh, make the resources available to them. So that was a process that we included. That's great. I just think we need to use either superintendent message or the principal mm -hmm. messages because that's where most of, I think, Barrett Snyder was on social media, not yes, around that, but I appreciate the efforts with that. Yes, mm -hmm. Yeah, I just want to remind everyone that we pushed hard for your survey for health and we got 2,700 responses is, and, and that's out of several tens of thousands, correct? That that survey went to. It was emailed twice to no, parents. No, but I know, but how many people 000, did we send it to? 33,143 two times. And so as much as we try to push stuff out, and it, 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 engagement is engagement, whether people come or not, and so, what we do in this balance of, and we've talked about this before, is, you know, I can tell you personally, I heard from several people who were tired of getting our emails <laughs> because we were sending too many. 
So, so where is this piece of, if we've posted it to social media and we've put it on our webpage and we've done, how much do I start to hound our parents to the point where they stop listening to us? Because that's always my fear and what we've talked about before, Ms. Chancellor, is too much and that's why we cut back on some of people's access to pushing out a lot because that's not what they want to hear. And so, it, it, you know, we're always trying to find something, but in the end, we can't make people come see our stuff. They're, they're going to have to make a choice to come see it or not, just like, you know, not very many filled out your survey, but enough did, and we gave them the opportunity in which to do it. Uh, you know, I, I would love for people to engage. Dr. Reck, I agree that it. you can't force it, but our job is to make sure they have the opportunity and they're well informed about the opportunity. I agree engagement is low and it's sure. unfortunate in my opinion, but that way, if there's ever issues, because we, seven, well, six of us now, responsive sure. to me, say, you are well informed whether it's the principal email, there's an appropriate platform in time, in my opinion. It can't always just be your superintendent message. But sure. there are ways to do it. But we need to make sure that we are clearly articulating and giving an appropriate time frame. Um, and once again, I know participation rates are low, but I know there are parents who care and want to be sure. involved. So yep. that's our responsibility to give them the out. opportunity. Absolutely. If they don't participate, then we can say you had the opportunity versus mm -hmm problems on the back end, that's my perspective on the issue. Well, sure, and, and, and uh, again, look, we want them to engage, that's why we pushed it out, we let them know. Um, whether they're well informed, Mr. Hilliard, you know, we've talked about that off and on is. So, you know, again, I, I, I think that's subjective to some extent. Some people are engaging, others are not with certain messages. It's why we do it in a variety of ways. Um, you know, you're saying my message or a principal's message, uh, you know, some people say they go to social media and that's where they get it. Some others go to our webpage and get it, you know, so we're trying to do it in all these different uh, places and we're dealing with multiple or generational pieces as well as some of our, 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 because we all know, right, we don't, some of our parents are grandparents and they get their messaging a little differently than um, our younger families today who want to go to um, whatever those things are, Instagram or TikTok or all that yeah. s s stuff, I, right? Like I, that I don't even engage in. But, but that's that piece. So, um, you know, I, I heard transparency. I'm going to push back. I, don't, I think we were transparent. I don't think we're hiding anything. Well, I don't think we are, but we're not communicating well. How about that? Because, I mean, I've watched the messages and I never saw a single thing. I don't, but I'm not on all the social media platforms, and I don't check our district website right. every single and, day, and so we sir, need to sure. figure out so, what that. So, Mr. Hilliard, again, I, I welcome your feedback as to how do you think that should look? I, because I, I think the new board needs to have some board messaging going every quarter where we're talking about what, what's coming at the board level, quite frankly. That's probably on us as a board to talk about. Well, the new board, depending on who's on there, in my opinion, and it maybe it's not on you because that's, this is a board level issue, quite frankly. But different conversation than tonight. We'll, we can... I appreciate your point. We can talk more afterwards, but I don't want to can keep we, everybody here. Can we move on yep. to science? Item three, possible action regarding Proclamation 2024 K through 12 Science Instructional Materials Adoption. Mr. Jarrett. Is there, Madam President, members of the board, Dr. Mike, executive staff, guests. Um, I'm here to present the science proclamation. Um, we went through a very similar process to CTE, but I want to highlight some of the, the things that we did to try to bring in more of the community involvement. One of the things I do want to share is we did try to rush this very quickly because the EMAT system that we used to purchase instructional materials closes uh, in April and doesn't open again until May 1st. And we were shooting for the last board meeting so that we could meet that deadline. The other thing is the State Board of Education didn't approve their final list of materials until November of 2023. So we really tried to push a really quick turnaround in our science proclamation process. So one of the things I'm really excited about is this is the first time in my 20 plus years of education that we're actually getting new instructional materials and new standards the very same year. We've always had to teach science with old instructional materials for at least a year or two uh, based on past proclamations. So this is an exciting time for us in science. So we broke ours down into phases. The first phase was really training teachers on the new TEKS. 
So we started way back in May of 2023, even though the TEKS were approved in 2020 for the high school core courses and 2021 for uh, K through eight and the science elective courses, um, we've been learning as a team of science teachers about these TEKS for four years. Now getting ready for this proclamation, we're trying to get all of the teachers on board and understand the new TEKS. So when we gathered our committee, our very first training was not about the instructional materials. It was about learning the new TEKS so that when they went into the evaluation process, they were evaluating the materials with the lens of the new TEKS. Uh, we also worked through a process of pre-screening some of the publishers. Uh, we wanted to make sure that they were aligned with the, uh, some of the things that Northeast does with their curriculum. So just to kind of go through that process, we leaned very heavily on the Texas Resource Review, which is what the state board used to create its final list from. So uh, they reported which publishers met 100% of the TEKS and 100% of the ELPS, and that was a non-negotiable for us we made sure that every resource we were considering met those criteria. Uh, the Texas Resource Review broke things down into content and instructional support categories. Um, this is not a percent of what's covered. This is actually a score that they received through rubrics that the Texas Resource Review used. We looked at those scores, we looked at the publishers, and we said the good cut point for us was a 75% on that to, to create a situation where we were getting enough publishers that we could consider for this proclamation. Um, the edu uh, educator support categories. These were things that the publishers provided to help teachers actually engage in instruction in the classroom. They rated the publishers on how well they did formative assessments, summative assessments, and what kind of resources were provided to teachers that would allow them to intervene or extend based on what was covered in, in the um, materials that the publishers put forward. So with that in mind, we set a cut point at 85% because that's a part of our teacher planning process that we encourage teachers to use, and we wanted them to have the high quality resources available to do that with. We also sent each publisher a Google form. There was actually two different forms that were sent out. One was sent out by our instructional technology department. The other one was sent out by our curriculum instructions uh, department. We asked them questions about how, how does your resource fit in with systems that we currently use in the district? For example, for curriculum instruction, um, we create a year at a glance document for teachers to follow within the district. Our teachers uh, work in co-creating those instructional planning guides with us. If a publisher were to put out a product that said, this is our core curriculum, you cannot change the order of the units, it would not fit in with the way that we've traditionally done things in Northeast. And we said that we would not consider that, that resource uh, as part of our proclamation. So we did narrow our um, publishers before we actually took this before the teachers in that phase one. The last thing we did in phase one is we tried to create um, access to the resources. So if you notice on that first slide, this phase went through December. We actually asked each of the publishers that met the cut to send the instructional materials to each campus. And then we created a web page that provided digital access. Now, one of the things that you run into, if you go to the TEA web page, a lot of the uh, links that they have are broken or they're based on materials that were submitted before the state board actually approved them. We actually worked with the publishers on our district webpage to get specific access that was uh, just for Northeast teachers, and we asked that they had 100% of the materials on there so our teachers could look at absolutely everything. This webpage was also linked on our launch pad, so it made it very easy for teachers to get to. Um, it was also posted in the announcements on our science webpage and was available to the public starting at the end of December. The webpage looks something like this. When you navigated to it, you would see the link at the top for our evaluation rubric. And then for each publisher being considered, we listed the course and grade level that were being uh, offered, the link to the actual um, login that they provided for us, along with the username and password that would allow you to get into those resources. Um, our phase two started in January, on January 1st. Um, 
we convened our committee again, and this time we shared with them the process we were going to use for adopting the materials. Um, we verified that they had received the printed materials that were sent out to the campus, and we hosted a vendor fair for our committee members. Uh, that was held at Piper Bass. The committee members got a half-day sub-funded day where they came in. The publishers actually went in-depth with each of our committee members on how to navigate those. Now, something else we leaned very heavily on the committee members for was to go back to the campuses and share that information with the teachers because our voting system was any teacher that completed the evaluation rubric was eligible to vote, even if they were not a committee member. So what that ensured is every vote had somebody that looked at all the instructional materials were being considered. We didn't want a situation where somebody went in and voted and said, I looked at one, I love that one, I'm not even gonna look at those other three. That was, that was part of our, our process. Then we jumped into phase three. Phase three started in February, and this is where we, we came in and uh, created a public-facing webpage. I should say public-facing because the other one was accessible to the public. It's just you had to navigate to our science landing page in order to get there. When it came time to actually trying to get um, input from the public, we created a, a calendar invite um, for our, um, trying to think what we called it for a second here, um, for our community event on March 7th. So March 7th is when we first posted uh, the calendar invite and we posted this web page. The community event was March 20th. We had an input period from the 7th to the 22nd with the public event being the time where they could actually come in and see the physical textbooks. On the form that we collected community input from, they could access the web page that had all of the links to get into the instructional materials. Our teachers during this period voted on instructional materials. Um, we analyzed the votes and we went through the selection process, negotiated price with the vendors, and we are here tonight presenting this information to you. So I'm gonna jump into the results from our vote. So in elementary, we're considering five different publishers. Um, the one that received the most votes was the Houghton Mifflin Harcourt in Texas Science. But because the voting was very close between Houghton Mifflin, um, edu uh, I'm sorry, uh, Discovery and McGraw-Hill, we wanted to make sure that we uh, looked at all three of them in terms of their pricing offers, options to see if one of them would actually outshine the other. So on the board book, um, I can't see what page that is. 18. On page 18, there's a breakdown of the cost. The line that is highlighted in green is the package that most of the teachers were looking at because the other thing that we collected from teachers is we asked them to, to uh, verify which publisher they liked best, but also what option because all of the publishers were offering print, digital, and some publishers were actually offering equipment packages. As you know, in elementary science, a lot of teachers do not get into the hands-on part of the um, curriculum because they may not have access to some of the equipment and materials that they need. So with the elementary, our teachers overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly said they wanted the digital, the print, and those equipment packages. So we looked at that pricing and Houghton Mifflin Harcourt came in at the lowest, but they also were the one that were, um, was voted on by the teachers. For the middle school science, uh, the teachers overwhelmingly selected the Savas Texas Experience. When you look at the, um, the options that the teachers wanted, if you notice the blue line represents the first choice um, first choice, they said they wanted print and digital or the print, digital, and equipment packages. But when you look at second choice, the print and uh, hardbound textbooks were really what the teachers wanted. And Savas was the only publisher that was offering a hardbound textbook. All the other publishers were offering consumable books for, uh, for students, and the cost of that over four years would have been much higher than actually getting the hardbound class sets along with the digital access. 
For high school, we broke it down by subject area. Uh, one thing I don't like about Google Forms is when it shows these pie charts, the same color doesn't represent the same um, publisher each time. So if you look at that in high school biology, high school chemistry, and high school physics, the teachers overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly selected the Savas resource. Uh, I'm going to skip IPC for a second and come back to that for the elective science courses. Uh, they were leaning towards the Cengage, but when we dug in and looked at that, the environmental systems course, actually those teachers preferred the Savas title and it was the astronomy and the earth systems teachers that preferred the Cengage. So we actually uh, decided that it would be best if you went with Savas for biology, chemistry, physics, and environmental systems. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, for IPC, they only had two publishers that we were, we were considering and the teachers overwhelmingly selected the McGraw-Hill. Um, for our community uh, input, um, again, we advertised initially March 7th, and this is a screenshot of the, um, if you would have clicked on the calendar link, um, if you notice there's a link directly to the voting form and there's a link to the web page on there. Um, we only had two people show up to the community event and this was something that we also pushed out through our social media platform. It actually went out on Facebook just before spring break and then we actually blasted it out again right after spring break trying to get uh, additional parents and community members to that event. Um, we only had four parents actually respond to the feedback form. But I do want to show that one graph I have in the bottom corner there, that represents visitations to our webpage. And basically, if you look at that, that low point on there, that is December. So when we rolled this out for teachers to start looking at instructional materials, our traffic went up tremendously. Um, when we started our voting window, it continued to go up, but not, uh, not quite so much. When we got to the uh, advertising this on the parent webpage, it actually shot up again, because that actually represents the month of March. So we did have increased uh, traffic to our science webpage as we pushed this out. We just didn't get a lot of physical people showing up or, or actually voting. Um, so based on what our teachers voted for and then our negotiations with the publishers, these were the packages that we, we ended up coming up with. And I do want to share something with the HB 1605 that um, relating to this. The reason we selected the four-year adoption package is right now HB 1605 is looking at high-quality instructional materials. The state board is going to start approving instructional materials that, that campuses are going to, or districts are going to be able to purchase. Uh, the allotment for that is the district gets a certain amount of money each year based on its enrollment but they have to use that money to buy off of that list of high quality instructional materials. Proclamation 2024 was excluded from that. So it was already in process when HB 1605 started, so they allowed us to go through with this proclamation. Um, so typical adoptions are eight year cycles. We decided against the eight year cycle because that's too long of an investment and we know it's probably going to take them about four years to create that list of approved high quality instructional materials specifically for science because they're going to start with the math and reading over the next couple of years and roll those out. So this will help us get through that period of time with instructional materials so that we can actually, um, if, we, if, we can, if we decide that we liked what we adopted, we can renew after those four years. If we're finding one of these is not meeting our needs, we can actually go through another adoption process in four years and select something different. I hope that helped a little bit with some clarity. So our final steps now is, you know, we're at the board meeting, we're hoping to get this approved. We have reached out with the vendors. The EMAT window opens up May 1st to start the orders. We have gotten a verbal commitment from all of our publishers that if we, if we purchase at the beginning of the EMAT window, they will actually start delivering printed materials as soon as May 15th, and they will work with us to get digital access with just a commitment from us. If we commit that we are going to be purchasing their product, they will open it up and allow us to uh, do some of that professional development that we would like to do with our teachers. Um, 
And then, of course, the other issue is when we go through our instructional planning guides, we start linking instructional materials in there, and that work needs to start as soon as possible um, because several of our teachers like to plan over the summer. So, what questions are bubbling up? <laughs> questions? There, there again, I wish somebody would have sent working links to us so we could look at these books. Well, this one we had last month, so it would have been incumbent upon ourselves to, I mean, to look into that when we got this a while ago. And I was so. able to click on links and look at materials. Were you guys able to navigate to the to the web page that we were created within the district, not the TEA one, because there, there were some flaws Actually, with the TEA. I tried going to the website, looking at um, the staff, I attempted to log in using my uh, district email address and password and first it said your access is denied and I thought okay I messed up with my mm -hmm. password went back in tried it again and then it just started looping me back to the login it would never let me in and I know she had some uh, big issues with hers also so we did make attempts to try to look at stuff, but we were just denied access to things. So to be fair, my attempts were to look at the existing curriculum, and Ms. Turner helped me with that. Um, I initially, when I tried to log in, it said access denied, but then after some conversation, I was able to mm -hmm. log in. Um, of course, that wasn't, that wasn't for this. I was trying to compare the and I know when we set up web pages, we, we have to give certain levels of support um, or access. And uh, when we created this web page, we made sure that we turned off everything so uh, anybody should have been able to get into that. But when it gets to the curriculum, you do have to be uh, an NEISD employee to be able to access the actual curriculum pages. And I was able to gain access to the current um the current stuff but I was able to earlier um, I can't remember exact dates but I was able to click on and review some of this material previously so thank you for that and, and I also want to share that um, you know with with the process of selecting the new teaks I, I know this was way back in 2020 um, as those teaks were being approved there was a huge public comment window that went in and the state board does a lot of modification of the TEKS during that process. When we started this process in May, we had the TEA approved list of instructional materials that we were going off of. So when we were vetting publishers, that list had not been approved by the state board yet. The state board meeting on um, November 17th, they actually eliminated a couple of the publishers from, from their list, and they also asked a couple of publishers to modify content um, the first day of the board meeting by the last day of the board meeting, and they, did, they had to go by and actually make changes to that curriculum in order to be considered. And there was a state board public comment period in the October state board meeting as well. Um, so are there any questions about this? For... No? Okay. Do I have a motion to approve the 2024 Proclamation Instructional Materials Purchases for K-12 Science Adoption as presented by the 2024 District Level Instructional Materials Committee and certify that all students will be provided with instructional materials that cover 100% of the TEKS? So moved. Thank you, Ms. Landry. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Byer. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Opposed. Okay, that motion carries. I. I'm one, correct? Okay. okay. Item C, consent one, instruction in campus administration A, off campus physical activity agency certification for middle school. Two, business services A, over 50,000 purchases. Three, operations. A, open records designation of 10 non-business days, four minutes from March 2024, five, end of consent. Do I have a board member wishing to pull an item from consent? Do I have a motion to approve consent? 
So moved. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries. Item 13 reports. A, interim financial and management reports. B, awarded bid report. C, federal grants report. D, open records request report. Those have been provided for you. Item 14, discussion and possible action regarding board member requests for items to be placed on a future agenda and our request for reports from the administration. Do I have a board member wishing for something? Yeah, Madam President, well, I've asked in January and February to get Mr. Lopez's opinion on the legal opinion about the SHAC reviewing the SA mental health program. Uh, it was in our previous uh, things, it's been two months, so I'm just gonna send him the email myself, but I would expect you to reply to the whole board, but um, as he articulated about the ad hoc and the health thing, um, by the way, 28004 is written, um, it should go through the shack, it has not. Um, so I'm just gonna send him the email because twice now it has not been uh, sent to me after being requested and we even approved it in the minutes last time. So I'll just do that, but just to make y'all aware, I'm gonna send that email because we need an answer as a board on that. Anything else? All right, um, item 15, adjournment, and the time is 10.13. Thank you, everyone.